Okay. Um, professor, um, so uh, shall we start our uh, session? Yes. Yeah, our session is the organ and system tissue and cell morphology, cardiovascular science and neuroscience. Our uh, chairman is Dr. Sirena Bianchi, uh, medical doctor, PhD, associate professor in human anatomy, Department of Life, Health and Environmental Sciences, the University L'Aquila, Italy. Thank you very much, Balzan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce the preliminary lecture. Our invited speakers is an award-winning researcher who is specialized in the role of stem cell in tissue engineering and carcinogenesis. He is also a member of uh, several editorial and their reviewing boards. He contributed uh, to the organization of national and international conferences. And uh, he was invited to give talks uh, in many international scientific meetings. Today, he will be sharing uh, with us uh, his uh, expert opinion. This is a, a subject in which we should all be deeply interested because it, um, I think, allows a better understanding of relevant pathologies. So uh, I'm excited to have him as a lecturer for this conference. So I feel honored to welcome Professor Sheriff Karam from the Department of Anatomy College of Medicine and Health Science, United Arab Emirates University. Thank you very much. I, I, I really appreciate the very um, welcoming introduction and, uh, and I, am, I am deeply delighted to be here and to participate in this very well organized symposium uh, and to talk to, uh, to morphologists or anatomists or histologists from all over the world who are hopefully joining or, or already joined the session. Um, in, in, my, in my talk today, um, yeah, bef before I say anything, I would like to, to, to welcome any questions. I'm not sure if, if audience will be able to ask questions during the session or not, but I will be happy if they are uh, able to ask questions. So feel free, please, if you, uh, if I go through any slide and you'd like to stop me to ask any questions, I will be very much delighted to answer any question during the session and as well as after the session. Um, uh, during my talk today, I will, I will, uh, I will, uh, I'm just trying to, uh, to remove my, uh, my, the, the images that I have so I can see my slides. During my talk today, I will uh, tell you what we have been uh, doing uh, in the past regarding the stomach stem cells. Um, and I will also summarize what we have been doing recently. And hopefully I will tell you also something about the future of gastric stem cells in health and disease, in mice as well as in humans. Um, so before starting, I would like to show you an image, uh, an aerial view of our uh, uh, campus um, in Al Ain City. Al Ain City is, is a beautiful city. It's, it's the city of oasis. So it's in the middle of the desert, but we have lots of water, underground water. So you find many green areas in our city. And this is the, I hope you can see my, my cursor. Can you see this green arrow? Yes. yes Excellent. We can see. Thank you very much. Um, so this is the, the aerial view of our campus. And, uh, and it has many buildings, several buildings. Uh, the student hostel is here. This is underground or, 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 or shaded uh, parking for cars. And there are many buildings for many colleges. The, the beautiful round college here in the center is the 
College of Information Technology. And we have here a beautiful building, which we refer to as the Crescent Building. And this is the building where our administration are, uh, are located. So the, 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 uh, the chancellor of the university, the, 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 uh, the vice chancellor and all administrators are in this beautiful building. And this area here, uh, this cover is actually for the library. So we have a huge library and it's underground. And we have also a huge theater underground in this area here. Uh, so this is a really a beautiful uh, campus and I invite you all to visit. Uh, and this road that you see here, it goes all the way to the capital of United Arab Emirates. If you drive from left to right and down here, you go all the way to Abu Zabi after maybe one and a half hour drive. And if you drive only for one kilometer, you will find this beautiful building, which is our college. So our college is away, slightly away from the, from the main campus. This is a college of medicine in Al Ain city. And uh, you see there are lots of flowers and, and the building is really beautiful. And um, my office is located here in the first floor and my lab is in the second floor here. Um, and underground in this area here, we have a huge animal facility and we also have a, a very nice uh, imaging unit. Um, so we are all proud actually of our uh, facility and our building and the city where we live. Um, now, the gastrointestinal tract, it's, it's really fascinating. Whenever I give a lecture to the students about the gastrointestinal tract, I always try to make them as fascinated as possible with different facts. Like for example, if you look at this, a uh, 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 highly coiled small intestine. If you stretch it, it's about six or seven uh, kilo, uh, uh, six or seven meters long. And if you cut open and stretch all the villi and the crypts, and then you stretch all the 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 micro villi on the surface of the of the epithelial cells, you get a huge surface area which is enough to cover the, the, a tennis court. So it's really a huge, and this is of course to ensure proper absorption uh, uh, and function for the small intestine. Now, another very, very interesting organ is the stomach, this most dilated part of the gastrointestinal tract, which doesn't differ much from the stomach of the mouse, uh, except that in the mouse, we have this whitish area here, which, is very similar to the esophagus in the fact that it is lined by stratified epithelium. Uh, that's why you see it whitish. It's, it's, uh, it's thinner, the wall is thinner, and it is lined by stratified epithelium. And the glandular stomach here is very similar to the glandular stomach of the human stomach. Uh, so it is really very uh, uh, fascinating to know that there are uh, different uh, 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 or, or numerous or millions of glands which are found in, the, in this small organ, which is found inside our, our abdominal cavity. Now, the plan of my presentation now, will, we will, I will be uh, talking about the structure or the morphology or the anatomy of the gastric gland. Um, uh, it's just a, a kind of introduction about the cells which are found in the gastric gland. And then I will tell you a little bit about an animal model which in which uh, uh, the, 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 the features of the biological features of the stem cells were, were, were altered. And this led to a, a, a very, very interesting uh, results, which I will share with you today. And then I will tell you about our efforts or our studies on the human gastric uh, 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 glands and the, 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 the hypothesis of the of the stem cell origin of cancer in the stomach. Uh, so, and then I will, if there are time, there is time, I will, I will also talk about the the uh, the 3D uh, culture model system that we have developed for gastric stem cells. Now, uh, if you examine the 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 stomach with the microscope, uh, you find many of these 
uh, uh, tubular structures. It looks like a test tube. It's really like a test tube. It has a blind end at the bottom and it has an opening here at the surface and the lumen of the stomach is here. So there are millions of these glands. It's a tubular gland, simple tubular gland. Sometimes they branch, but in general, they are simple tubular gland with a very narrow uh, lumen, as you see here. This is the lumen of the gland. This is a montage which was generated by light microscope some years ago. And, uh, and if you examine carefully the, the wall of, these, of this gland to see the different types of cells, you see uh, a fascinating differences between the cells. And, uh, and for example, if you examine the cell here at near the surface or at the surface, they, they are elongated, so they are columnar cells, and they have dense granules near the apical surface, which contain mucus. If you examine them with electron microscopy and with immunohistochemistry, you'll discover that these granules contain mucus. And this is a mucus that is involved in the formation of the mucus uh, layer on the luminal surface for protection uh, against the noxious, noxious agents that, that, that we eat and that are present in the stomach. Um, if you look in the middle of the gland here, again, with the light microscope, it's difficult to see much details, but you find that there is another type of cell uh, which found in the neck region. Uh, uh, we, it's also mucus secreting cells. So the green color that you see here are the granules which contain mucus, but each granule has a small core, uh, uh, which is here presented with a white color to indicate that it's, it's a pepsinogenic core. It's not, it's not um, mucus. So it's these glands or these cells secrete both mucus and pepsinogen as well, uh, but mostly mucus. And that's why we call it mucus neck cells. Now, if you look at the bottom of the gland, you find a totally different cell. It's, it's, a, it's a serous cell, typical serous cell with basal basophilia and epical acidophilia with the light microscope, if you, if you examine H and E stain section. And you find that the basal, uh, these basal cells are rich in these big granules. The granules here are small, moderately large, and here they are huge or large, largest. Um, so these granules are entirely pepsinogenic. They contain pepsin or pepsinogen. Uh, so the same pepsinogen found here, it's also found here, but, but no mucus here. Um, now, there is a third or a fourth type of cell, which is also very fascinating. And these are the parietal cells or the acid secreting cells. They have very peculiar features. Um, they have intracellular canaliculi. So they are large cells, as you see here, and the apical surface of the cells carry a lot of long microvilli, as you see here, which invaginate to form these uh, intracellular canaliculus. And, and you can see some of these canaliculi in, in cross section here. But the characteristic feature of, of these long microvilli is typical when the cells are activated, when they are stimulated to produce acid. These are the acid secreting cells. Uh, if they are inhibited with any <clears throat> anti-acid like, like um, <clears throat> like um, uh, uh, omeprazole, for example, these cells will acquire a different morphology. The, 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 the canaliculus will become minimal. It will become very, very tiny. And the apical microvilli will become very few, but the cell will acquire a lot of tubular vesicles inside the cytoplasm. And when the cells are activated, again, these tubular vesicles will be translocated from the cytoplasm to the apical surface. So this, this is a parietal cell which has attracted many scientists and physiologists because of their role in acid secretion and their role in ulcer development. Um, there are two other types of cells which are to some extent neglected, um, uh, like endocrine cells, for example. There are many types of endocrine cells in, along this gastric gland. They are scattered everywhere, like the parietal cells are also scattered. But the endocrine cells are scattered and they are different categories. Uh, uh, we call them the enteroendocrine cells of the, of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, and also the other type of cell which is very much neglected, which is a tuft cell or the cavulated cells. And these cells are also scattered like the endocrine cells. So they are maybe this is one of the reasons why they are uh, neglected, these tuft cells, because they are scattered, they are few, they are not numerous, they're not prominent in H and E stain sections. <clears throat> but they are there and they are functional and they are really very important. Now, these are the cells which have been known for long in the, in the gastric gland. 
But when you take a section of them, a small section, tissue section from the, from the uh, uh, mouse stomach, and you stain it with two different markers of, uh, uh, that detect at least two of these cells that I just mentioned, the pit cells, which are found at the surface, and the neck cells, which are found in the middle of the, of the gastric gland. This is a section of the, uh, of the wall of the stomach, the body region of the stomach here. It shows the luminal surface here. This is the lumen of the stomach. These are some debris from the lumen, uh, maybe some mucus elements of mucus that are released into the stomach, some food particles. And the, the muscle layer of the stomach is down here below this. So this is the whole mucosa. And, and if you, I, I make a boundary for one gland, this is actually representing one gland. So it's like a test tube. And there are, you can see how many they are. There are many of these glands side by side like this. Uh, so the markers of these two cells stain two different types of cells and they, they show an area at the junction which is to some extent uh, uh, labeled. It could be labeled with the green color of neck cells or the red color of pet cells uh, or it doesn't have any label at all. So this is the area that has been, uh, uh, so this is again a diagram of the gastric gland showing the cells that stain red, the cells that stain green. These are lectins that are specific for two different types of mucus. Uh, uh, and they, they, we use them in the lab on regular basis as markers for these two types of cells. And the, these round cells here are the parietal cells, the acid secreting cells, which are not labeled in this section. And the chief cells are the also not labeled, and they are, but they are found in the basal part of the gland here. Um, now the area in between here is really fascinating because it shows very small, tiny cells. If you look carefully with the microscope, you will see small cells, and they are there. They are either labeled with one of these two markers or not labeled at all. Um, and and there has been a question mark about these cells for quite some time. Now we many years ago we used the technique of radiotography to uh, uh, to, to test the proliferative capacity of cells within the gastric gland. And we, so we injected radioactive thymidine, the tritium thymidine into mice, and then we sacrificed the mice uh, 30 minutes later. It can be 30 minutes or one hour later. Uh, so it's like a pulse, a single pulse of thymidine. And then we dissected the, 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 the stomach and we uh, processed for uh, uh, for for uh, embedding and for um, coating for radiotography um, with the, with the emulsion and if there are cells which incorporate the thymidine they will appear radioactive they will show that so the radioactivity will appear like like uh, like uh, silver grains that uh, that will hit the emulsion and it will the silver grains will develop indicating the place where the thymidine was incorporated. So all the dark cells that you see here, blackish cells, if you look closer to your monitor, you'll be able to see fine granules. These are the silver grains or silver granules that are covering the tissue section, indicating that these are the cells that incorporate the thymidine. We know that thymidine is an analog. Uh, 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 sorry, thymidine is one of the bases uh, uh, of the of the DNA. So and and the, the, the cells that are in the cell cycle during the S phase, I'm sure everyone remember the, the G1, the S phase, the G2, and then the mitosis. So during the S phase, the, the, the DNA synthesis phase, this is the, the phase when uh, the, the bases of, of DNA are incorporated for DNA synthesis. So it tells you when the cells are labeled with the thymidine, it tells you that these are the cells which are in the cell cycle which are in the S phase of the cell cycle specifically. So during the 30 minutes, these cells were in the cell cycle. Uh, um, so these are highly proliferative cells. You don't see any label up or down. Occasionally you might find a labeled cell here or here, but, but these are the most active cells in proliferation. So this was very, very interesting. The second interesting point was, um, if you give the injection and you wait for a couple of days and then you sacrifice the animals and you do the same thing with the tissue sections from the stomach, you find that the, the, these silver uh, green covered cells are, or radioactive cells have moved away from the, 
from the area where these cells were originally located. They move up and down. So they migrate up and down within two days. So they are no longer here in the ethmus. They migrate. And this tells you, this very simple experiment tells you two important facts. That the cells which are proliferative in the gastric gland are found in this region, which is at the junction between the pet cells, the, the red cells that I showed you in the previous slide, and the green cells, so the mucus cells here and the other type of mucus cells here. In between them, these cells are located or scattered. And the other fact is that these proliferative cells are very short-lived. So they, they, they divide and they migrate and they give rise to the cells which are found up in the pet region. And they migrate also in the other direction to give rise to, to the cells which are in the neck region. And they eventually they migrate all the way down. So this was a long, this is a brief uh, uh, slide that I'm summarizing a long uh, study that, that was described in details uh, in the past. Um, so this indicate that the stem cells or the progenitor cells of the stomach are located in this area here, and they produce all the, the cells which are found in the gastric gland. Now, <clears throat> so just to remind you about the two main characteristic features which are already mentioned about the stem cells. So they are characterized by their ability to divide, to maintain themselves, and also to differentiate and give rise to other cells that will migrate and become specialized. Um, now, if you examine this area with electron microscopy, this area of the dividing cells, this area of progenitor cells, this area of, of the highly dividing cells, most active cells in mitosis in the, in the gastric gland, you, you will find that there are at least four different types of cells that I am presenting here. These are the four different types of progenitor cells which are found in the stomach, in, in the gastric, in each gastric gland of the stomach. So they all very small, as you see here, so this is the basal surface of the cell. This is the epical surface of the cell. And these are the lateral surfaces of the cells. So you see then the, the size of the cell is really small and the nucleus is large in relation to the size of the cytoplasm. And if you look closer to the, to the screen, you might be able to see these fine blackish dots which represent the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. So they are also very rich in ribosomes. So all these features are features of, of embryonic cells. Uh, if you examine, uh, tissue, embryonic tissue, you find many of these cells. The, the, so they are immature cells. They are embryonic-like cells. Um, and that's why they, 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 they are progenitors. And three of them, of these three types of cells, are capable of mitosis. That's why you see these blackish silver grains here. So this is radiotography done with electron microscopy, combined with electron microscopy. So these the progenitors these three progenitors are capable of mitosis. Now, if you look carefully at the epical surface of this cell here, that I'm, I'm focusing on it more <laughs> than the others, this, this uh, epical surface here has long microvilli, like the microvilli of the parietal cells that I showed you in the diagram. So this is a progenitor of parietal cells. That's why we call them pre-parietal cells. Uh, if you look at the epical surface of these cells, in addition to these immature features, you find that there are small tiny granules that, that, that have uh, contents in their cytoplasm, very similar to the contents, they have the same texture, the contents of the uh, pet cells or the mucus cells that are found on the surface and along the pet region. And that's why we refer to these as pre-pet cells. If you look at the, 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 this progenitor here, it has granules, small granules, not as large as the mature granules I showed you for the neck cells, but they also have a, a core. So these are the, the, the cells that are qualified to be the progenitors of, of the neck cells. And that's why we call them pre-neck cells. Um, now, if you look at the other type of cell here, it has neither of these type of granules. It does not have also epical, uh, long epical microvilli. And that's why we refer to these cells. And they are the most proliferative, by the way. We refer to them as the granule-free cells or the stem cells. Um, which, based on our calculations with, with the, with the, with the um, uh, continuous infusion experiments and pulse chase experiments, that they, they are the most proliferative and they, they give rise to, to these three types of cells. Now, these two progenitors can give rise to this progenitor here. This progenitor, the pre-parietal cell, cannot divide. We, I'm, 
we have never been able to see these cells dividing, these progenitor cells. And this is a, a characteristic feature of the preparietal cell. Also, mature parietal cells do not divide. Occasionally in human stomach, you find parietal cells. I'm sure you mentioned that if you teach histology to medical students, that occasionally parietal cells might have two nuclei. So it indicates that the cells might be able or might be capable of getting into the cell cycle, but they cannot separate. So that's why they have two nuclei. Like chief cells also, they do that. Uh, and like hepatocytes in the liver also, they, they do that. Now, if, uh, uh, if you look at the, 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 now the progeny of these progenitors, so these progenitor, when they differentiate, they give rise to these uh, PET cells or surface mucus cells, um, uh, which have granules. Yes? Any question? Uh, are, no there, question, you are so clear. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, these cells differentiate and give rise to the pet cells, and these preparietal cells give rise to the parietal cells, and the pre neck cells uh, differentiate and give rise to the neck cell first, and then give rise to the chief cells. Uh, now, in human, if you examine the human stomach, you find very similar progenitors also in the, in, the, in, the, in the human stomach, in the gastric gland of the human stomach. So there are four different progenitors and they follow the same pathway. Of course, it was not possible to, to, to inject human with radioactive thymidine, it will be impossible. But, but just based on electromicroscopic analysis, it was possible to identify similar progenitors that give rise to the surface mucus cells and the parietal cells or the acid secreting cells and the chief cells. Um, now, in summary, we have four progenitors in the, in the gastric gland. Three of them are proliferative and they are capable of division and giving rise to, to the preparietal cells. So the parietal cells are really unique because they have three different sources. So they can come directly from the stem cell or from the pre-pet cell or from the pre-neck cell. Uh, but the other types of cells, they come from a single progenitor. So this cell comes directly from the, the stem to pre-pet to pet cell. Um, and the same for the zymogenic cells. Uh, th there has been recently some, some uh, 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 challenging experiments that have been carried uh, describing some other models. So this model is not, I have, I have to say that this model that we have established many years ago, um, many people have reanalyzed, and there, there has been some challenging questions that have been raised, uh, but uh, to some extent it is still valid and people are still until now testing it and trying to validate the, the concept of, the, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of this stem cell and the, 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 the differentiation pathways for the different cell lineages. Uh, as I told you, for, for example, that zymogenic cells has some capacity to divide as well. And there are steps in between the next cell and zymogenic cells, which is called the pre-zymogenic cells. It's intermediate between this cell and this cell. So, so um, now if I move forward now, yeah. Um, so one of the questions that we raised uh, several years ago or some years ago uh, was why these cells are not, are not dividing and what happened if they divide? So we collaborated with a group in Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Jeff Gordon, and, and um, it was really fascinating collaboration because I, I was really delighted to, to see these cells dividing. If you generate transgenic mice, which are expressing the, the, the simian virus 40 large T antigen gene in specifically in the parietal cell lineage, from the time they are born, from the time they start to develop, from the time when pre-parietal cells develop during, during uh, 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 the pre uh, the post the early postnatal days of life of the mouse. So we found that when they are expressing uh, the T antigen gene using the the promoter of the HK ATPase, so the promoter and and the T antigen gene, it's it's a kind of fusion gene that was expressed in these cells, and this induced proliferation of these cells. 
So proliferation of these cells was uh, a question that we have raised. What will happen to the to to the to these progenitors and to the parietal, the mature parietal cells if the progenitors were induced to proliferate? Are we going to have plenty of parietal cells? Uh, 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 this did not happen. Let me show you now what happened. So now we, we I'm showing you now a section of the gastric uh, uh, mucosa labeled with four different markers. Uh, uh, one for the pit cells, which are found at the luminal surface here. So the lumen of the stomach is up and the muscle layer is at the bottom of the screen. The neck cells in the neck region is found here. They are labeled with this purple uh, uh, color. Uh, and the parietal cells are also labeled with this red color. This is an antibody for the hydrogen potassium ATPase specific for the parietal cells. So they are labeled red. And the stem cells are, are labeled, or the progenitor cells are labeled with, with bromodeoxyuridine. So you can see here, uh, uh, bromodeoxyuridine is an analog for thymidine. So it can be used as, as a, a marker to identify uh, uh, the dividing cells. So the dividing progenitor cells are found in the, at the border between the pet cells and the neck cells, as I demonstrated earlier to you. So this is the area of the progenitor cells. Now, what happened to the stomach when the uh, T antigen gene was overexpressed in the parietal cell lineage, uh, in the progenitors of the parietal cell lineage? So again, this is a, um, these, are two, these are two mice. One is uh, a wild type, and the one is on the right-hand side is a transgenic mouse. Not sure if I can move this bar. I don't want to touch it. So uh, the, the pet cell uh, is found here near the luminal surface. Um, the neck cells are found in, the, in, the, in, in their location also deep in the gland uh, or in the middle of the gland. Parietal cells were absent. So when we stain these two sections side by side, there was parietal cells here, but no parietal cells here. So the parietal cells here were completely absent. But when you stain for the stem cells, the dividing cells, so these mice received single injection of, of bromodeoxyuridine instead of tritium thymidine, we gave single injection of bromodeoxyuridine to label the dividing cells. We found that there are plenty of dividing cells. Look at the number of green labeled nuclei as compared to here. Here you can count them. They are just four or five cells. But here there are plenty of, of these dividing cells. So it seems that we have amplified the progenitor cells, which made me extremely excited because th these are the cells that are very few and difficult to identify. So when they are amplified, when they increase, you can study them much better. You can use them for many experiments. Um, and this is what we did, as I will show you in a few minutes. So in summary, th this is the model. This, you have a stem cell that give rise to three progenitors and they proceed and differentiate and give rise to three different cell lineages. Um, if you overexpress or express the T antigen gene in the parietal cell lineage, they will proliferate. And the proliferation of these cells will lead to the block in their differentiation. So the, the adult cells will stop developing. Um, and also, interestingly, that the zymogenic cells also stop to differentiate. So you end with pet cells, neck cells, but no chief cells, and a huge number of preparietal cells, and also these progenitors were amplified. So you end with a gland that looked like a, a gland full of progenitor cells. And this was extremely uh, 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 wealth of material to study and to investigate. Um, so you can see that the, the progenitor cells were really amplified. Now, we know now that within this area between the red and the green cells, between the pet and the neck cells, we have the stem cells, which are the highly active proliferative stem cells. But we also know from the literature that the mucus layer on the top of the gastric gland or lining the lumen of the gastric gland for protection, it also has H. pylori the Helicobacter pylori. I'm sure everyone heard about Helicobacter pylori and you know how important it is for gastroenterologists and for gastrointestinal cell biologists. So these cells, this, this bacteria here at the top, they survive within this 
area and they have a mechanism to protect themselves against the acidic environment and the harsh environment of the stomach. And people have, uh, 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 so the question that we raised is what, what happens between H. pylori and the stem cells or the progenitor cells? Is there any, any relationship between them? Um, so people have studied the H. pylori and for long it's been known and demonstrated that they interact with the surface mucus cells. So there are uh, 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 binding that happens between the two types of cells. There are receptors on the, on the, um, uh, on the, on the H. pylori that bind to to the, um, to the, to the uh, glycoproteins on the surface of the surface mucus cells. And, and that's it almost. Also people have found that this Hel Helicobacter pylori, they, they inhibit the production of somatostatin, which we know that it is important for, for, for inhibiting or maintaining or regulating the level of gastrin. So if there is H. pylori, the level of gastrin will increase because of inhibition of, of the somatostatin release by D cells in the stomach. <clears throat> and this will lead to more acid, will lead to activation of parietal cells. We know that parietal cells have receptors for gastrin. And once the, the gastrin is released, it binds to its receptor on the basolateral surface. And then it will activate the translocation of the tubular vesicle to the epical membrane. And they acquire the, the stimulated morphology and secrete more and more acid. And this is why the H. pylori contribute to the peptic ulcer and the, and the gastric inflammation or gastritis. Uh, so we, we <coughs> excuse me, we, <coughs> we ask the question whether there is any interaction between the stem cells and the helicobacter pylori in the stomach. So to answer this question, it, it became very easy now with this animal model of amplified progenitor cells. So we uh, designed, again, in collaboration with Jeff Gordon in St. Louis, we designed, uh, uh, I had a very, very fruitful collaborations with, with Professor uh, Jeff Gordon in St. Louis, and I used to, 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 to visit his lab many times, um, and, and we generated several uh, important articles together. So we, we, we designed an, a very simple experiment in which the transgenic mice with the amplified progenitors were, uh, were uh, uh, exposed to H. pylori. So we gave them an, an oral gavage of, of the H. pylori. And then we waited for 30 days. And after 30 days, we took the stomach of these mice uh, and we examined them with different microscopy techniques, uh, fluorescence, confocal, and electron microscopy. And then here is uh, one of the results. So we, this is an, uh, a fluorescence microscopy image taken at high magnification, showing the area in between the mucus, the two types of mucus cells. One type is above, the other type is below. And these are the progenitor cells labeled with a specific lectin that bind to the epical surface of these progenitors. And it, the section is also uh, labeled with an antibody specific for H. pylori. So after 30 days, uh, uh, of giving the oral gavage of H. pylori, parietal cells, oh, no, sorry, not parietal cells, uh, the, the progenitor cells in the area of the, of, the, of the stem cell zone, they acquire H. pylori. So H. pylori gets very close to the, of course they are on the surface, they are in the pit, but they are also here in the area that we are interested in. Um, now, it's not very clear whether the, there is a direct relationship or not, but at least we see the labeled very close to each other. <clears throat> we did with the confocal microscopy, we, we took sections, cross section of the, of the gastric gland. This is an image taken with the confocal microscope showing one image, showing one gland cutting cross section. So this is the lumen of the gland. This is the, the cells lining the gland. Most of them are small cells. You can see the negative image of the nuclei and the lateral membrane of the cells. This is the epical surface of the cells. And and the, the, the animal was injected with bromodeoxyuridine. So the blue color that you see here is a nucleus which, is, uh, uh, which has incorporated, or the DNA in the nucleus has incorporated the bromodeoxyuridine. So this cell here, at the time when it was, uh, it was captured, it was in 
the S phase of the cell cycle. So it is a dividing stem cell or a dividing progenitor cell. Um, and you can see that it is also labeled with the uh, marker for H. pylori. And uh, if you, these, these are actually multiple images that are stacked together. If I uh, move the slide, I hope you can see it moving also. Can you hear me? Yes, it's wonderful. Excellent, yes. thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad you can hear me uh, and you can see my screen. So th these are the, 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 the evidence that shows that the H. pylori is actually inside the cell, not only attached to the surface, but it is actually within the cell. Uh, uh, now, if I, if I move to the next slide of, to, to further confirm this, we did some electromicroscopic analysis of these mice after they are uh, uh, the, the ingested the, the, the H. pylori. So here we, we, we see an electron transmission electron micrograph showing the H. pylori in the lumen of the gastric gland. And this is the epical surface of some progenitor cells. And you see it's very close to the, to the surface of the cells. And in many other images, we found that there are uh, uh, H. pylori within the cytoplasm of the cells. So it seemed that, and they look healthy, that the H. pylori, they look happy. So the, the and the cells also look healthy and look happy. So it seems that there is a kind of uh, 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 relationship between the H. pylori and the gastric stem cells. Uh, whether this will remain forever like this or it might lead to some pathological changes, uh, we did not follow up this. But, but it is being demonstrated now that, that the H. pylori, they interact with the progenitor cells. And the availability of this transgenic mice with a huge number of progenitor cells made it easy or possible to investigate uh, or to answer this question. Now, if I uh, summarize this part, so we know that H. pylori is found on the luminal surface of the cells. We know that there are stem cells here between the surface mucus cells and the mucus neck cells at the bottom. And we know that from other studies that the H. pylori bind to the luminal surface of the, of the mucus cells. But we also have demonstrated that H. pylori can also go through the, 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 the lumen of the gastric gland and they can reach the area of the progenitor cells and they can survive within the cytoplasm of these stem cells. Uh, now, the question arises now whether stem cells are involved in gastric carcinogenesis. We know that H. pylori is, is, is a carcinogenic bacteria. And we know that uh, there is an, an old theory talking about uh, the stem cell origin of cancer. And, uh, and one of the markers that, are, that is well known for, for stem cells is OCT4. OCT4 is, is, a, is a, a, a transcription factor which is known to be important for the pluripotency and self-renewal of the stem cells. Um, th there was a very interesting study that has pointed out the, 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 the idea of, of the following experiment that I will tell you, uh, that, that in this study, a group in, in, in Germany has, has uh, uh, expressed OCT4 in the small intestine of some animals. This is a kind of ectopic expression. And they found that when it is overexpressed, it leads to uncontrolled proliferation of the progenitor cells. So it sounds like, like, like if you have OCT4 in the intestine, this will lead to carcinogenesis. So this stimulated us to study, to start a project uh, on OCT4. And we started by looking at the expression of OCT4 in the mouse stomach. Um, so we took crude homogenate of neonatal gastric mucosa and adult gastric mucosa from, from mice. And we ran protein gel. So this is a crude homogenate that was loaded here. And the crude homogenate for the adult stomach was loaded here. And the, the, the proteins were transferred into membranes and probed with antibodies specific for OCT4. And we got a huge band here, very dense band in the neonatal tissue. But in the adult, we got small band. And this is what we anticipated. We anticipated in the neonatal mice that there will be more uh, 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 stem cells or progenitor cells as compared to the adult mice. This is a developing uh, uh, stomach that has more dividing cells as compared to the adult stomach. Of course, the adult stomach has, is overwhelmed with all the other cell types. Uh, so this was a very positive uh, signal for us. So we, we further 
uh, tested a, a stem cell line that we have in the lab, we established from this transgenic mouse. Uh, and, uh, and here we loaded the OCT4 peptide as a positive control. And we also tested this gastric stem cell line that we have from the mouse. And we found also that the OCT4 is expressed in this cell line. So then we, we thought about the human stomach. How about the human stomach? Uh, so we asked different questions. Is, is OCT4 expressed in the human stomach? This is my, our first question. Second, what happened during development of cancer? Uh, during the process of gastric carcinogenesis, we know that it's a kind of multi-step process. So what happened during this process to OCT4 expression? And are the stem cells involved in gastric, and, and, and are stem cells involved in gastric carcinogenesis? So would we be able to provide an answer to this question? So we carried out a, a, a collaborative project with uh, uh, clinicians in our, in our college here, um, uh, uh, just to, to demonstrate to you the multi-step process of gastric carcinogenesis, which was established uh, many years ago, uh, that normal human stomach, when it is affected by mild gastritis, if it is not treated properly, it may progress into atrophic gastritis. And if it is not treated properly and it remains for a long time, becomes chronic, it may lead to metaplastic changes, so change in the morphology of the, of the epithelial cells and development of maybe uh, uh, goblet cells in the stomach. And eventually it will lead to dysplastic changes which are, which are precancerous and eventually lead to cancer. So this is the, the, the multi-step process of gastric carcinogenesis that we wanted to study, we wanted to, to evaluate also. So we, we communicated with, with uh, 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 gastroenterologists. I hope I have time, or shall I stop here uh, as you like? I, I think uh, we have uh, time. Okay. So what I'll do you think, Balzan? Uh, so yes, many... please go on. This is so interesting. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> we have too much interesting. <laughs> yes. I am yes. glad you are saying that. Thank you so much. So, so we we uh, communicated with gastroenterologist and gastrointestinal uh, 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 surgeon as well. And we, we know that in gastroenterology clinics, many patients visit these clinics because of upper GI problems. Uh, uh, sometimes people feel heartburn or epigastric pain after they eat and they take some medi medication, it doesn't go away. So they go to the gastroenterologist, he will prescribe something more strong like, like acid inhibitor then it will not be cured. It will keep coming back and back again. And, and finally, he will tell them, do you mind if I schedule you for an endoscopy examination? They, they will be scheduled for endoscopic examination. So these are the, the, the individuals that we targeted. These are people, uh, patients who have upper GI problems or signs, and they have been on medication for several time, and they are scheduled for endoscopic examination. So we arranged with the, with, the, with the gastroenterologist to collect biopsy from these patients. Of course, the biopsy will mostly go to pathology department in the hospital to make the diagnosis or the proper diagnosis, but we will also collect one or two biopsies from each of these patients. So we used to get at least one from the antrum and one from the corpus region of the stomach of these patients. Uh, we, we collected biopsies from about 105 patients uh, over a period of time. And then we also, with the help of the, of the gastrointestinal surgeon, we collected tissues from gastric cancer patients. Uh, we know that gastric cancer is, is, is common in many places. It is that, 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 that maybe it's, it's, it's really common, more common in some places than others, uh, but, but it is also common here. So we collected uh, uh, cases from, or tissues from four patients who are, are undergoing uh, radical gastrectomy. So they remove most of the stomach from, from these patients. So, and then, and, and, and we collected tissues. We, we, we received big pieces of tissues. So we collected tissues from three different regions. We collected tissue from the safe margin, uh, from the tumor edge, and from the center, the tumor center, the center er, central area of the tumor. So the edge is a kind of junction between the safe margin and the tumor edge and the central area as well. And then we process these samples for simple histological uh, examination uh, and some immunohistochemistry. 
And we did also some electron microscopy on this. And we did some protein chemistry on these samples that are collected from these patients. Now, let me show you now the, the, the first image that we got. This is an image of a, of a, of, um, of a biopsy that was uh, collected from a patient with some, he's not normal, he's having some upper GI problem, but when we examine the stomach, it looks normal. Uh, this, is, this is the antrum. So we have, we are not expecting to find any parietal cells or chief cells here. So we have the, the gastric pits with the mucus cells and we have the gastric glands here. And this is the area at the junction in between the, the pit and the gland. Um, so we, we, we found that there are at least one third of the patients that have such morphology. So one third of the patient are microscopically looking normal. Uh, one third of the 104 patients that we collected. Another one third, approximately one third, we found that the patients have some elements of um, inflammatory cells infiltrating in the lamina propria. And there were some increase in the number of dividing cells, as you see here. They became prominent, just with mitotic figures. Um, and we did other uh, uh, labeling to see, to, to see the, the dividing cells as well, but, but there were more dividing cells here than here. And we classified this tissue as a tissue with mild gastrites. So this is a second category of biopsies that we received, so mild gastrites. And then the third category was severe gastritis, massive infiltration with lymphoid tissue lymphoid uh, and even formation of a small lymphoid nodule and absence of some of some gastric glands and massive infiltration with with lymphoid cells in the lamina propria and we classified these as severe gastritis or atrophic gastritis and then we examined so these are the the 104 biopsies these are the three categories of the patient that we we identified one third is normal one third mild gastritis one third severe gastritis and then the, the cancer tissues were categorized again into three categories. This is a safe margin, how the mucosa looks like, which looks more or less like this, but look at the thickness of the mucosa. All these images are taken at the same magnification. Of course, some of them are montages like this. This is a montage, multiple images taken together. And this is another montage. And so as you move forward from normal to mild to severe to safe margin to tumor edge, and finally, the tumor center here. So this is tumor edge, this is tumor center. The, the mucosa, mucosa thickness increases and the gastric glands are becoming more and more, uh, they disappear. So in the safe margin, you see like it's very similar to severe gastritis with loss of the gastric gland, most of the gastric gland here. There are infiltration with a lot of cancer cells and, and here also the same thing. Um, if you look at the severe gastritis, we were able to identify some uh, samples which have metaplastic changes. In addition to the evidence of severe gastritis, they have some goblet cells that are developed in the, in the gastric gland. You can see this gland here on the left side, it has mucus cells, but here you have goblet cells and it has also brush border. So there are absorptive cells. So intestinal epithelium and gastric epithelium here. And some other glands shows uh, meta, uh, uh, dysplastic changes, loss of gland glandular architecture, like what you see here as well. So this represents the multi-step process of gastric carcinogenesis. We were very happy to have this material. So now we have a wealth of material that represents the multi-step process of gastric carcinogenesis from mild, from normal to mild to severe gastritis and three different uh, uh, regions of the gastric uh, uh, cancer tissue. We assembled all these sections on, on slides. So we have now a, a kind of uh, tissue array uh, showing the different conditions. And, and we probe these sections with OCT4, for OCT4 expression to see how OCT4 is expressed in these tissues. And we found that in the normal tissue, there are some OCT4 labeled cells. They are not numerous, but there are some, and they are found in the bottom of the gastric pits. And in the, in the gastritis patient, these cells are much more and, and they expand in the gastric mucosa. And in the metaplastic patient and dysplastic patients, it is even more. And in the gastric cancer patient, this is an image taken at lower magnification as compared to these. It shows that the, the, the cells, even at the surface, they, they express OCT4 and deep in the, in, the, in, the, in the mucosa, you can see also some scattered uh, OCT4 labeled cells. So we quantified this uh, 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 
labeling area using image analysis uh, software. And we have uh, uh, found that or, or, or shown that there are uh, a gradual increase in the amount of OCT4 labeling in these tissues. So it seems that OCT4 play a role in gastric carcinogenesis if it is increasing with the development of cancer. We also looked at the chemistry part or the, or the, or the protein part. So this is a protein collected from uh, um, the mucosa of the OCT4, uh, 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 from the mucosa of the normal stomach. And this is from the cancer, one of the cancer tissues. And then we, 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 we saw this to confirm the, the, the immunohistochemical analysis. We thought also to, to check the cytoplasmic versus nuclear fractions of these samples. So this is control tissue here on the left side, control tissue, nuclear fraction. So in the, in the control individuals, the OCT4 is mostly found in the nucleus, which fit with the idea that it is a transcription factor. So it should be in the nucleus. There is a little bit in the cytoplasm. And in the cancer tissues, the three different regions of the cancer tissues collected, it is the opposite. So you find more cytoplasmic than nuclear, which tells you that when the, 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 the tissues transform from normal to carcinogenic, they, 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 there is an alteration in the translocation of OCT4. OCT4, of course, it is synthesized in the cytoplasm. Then it has to be translocated to the nucleus. So it seems that with the development of cancer, the, 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 the OCT4 tend to accumulate in the cytoplasm and, and, and it loses the machinery to be transported into the nucleus. Um, so in, this is also confirmed here in this high magnification images. You can see in the control, nuclear staining is more. And in the cancer tissue, you have more cytoplasmic staining here. Um, so it seems that this is the, the a summary diagram showing the normal expression of OCT4 in the human stomach and the, the, in the cancer tissue, how it is, uh, uh, its translocation to the nucleus is blocked. And this is a working diagram or working, working model showing how OCT4 changes with, with, from normal to gastritis and finally to cancer. Uh, so th there is a gradual amplification of these OCT4 uh, positive cells, which, which support the idea of, of, uh, uh, of stem cell origin of cancer. I think I'm going to stop here. It's, it's, a, it's a long story, but, but uh, hopefully I will be able to talk again about this uh, in the near future. And if you have any question, I will be very, very happy to answer you. Um, Thank you very much. I'm sorry Professor. for exceeding my time. Don't worry, don't worry. We, we was uh, very, very interesting in your presentation because you, uh, you, you made simply uh, a lot of concepts that uh, often are difficult to explain to our students. <laughs> Thank you very so much. are there any questions? Yes, sir. Professor uh, Bianchi, there is a question uh, at the chat. Can you see oh. it? Oh, yes. What is Ali? How prepit cell and prenex cell can give rise to preparietal cells? The first uh, question. Yes. And okay. okay. Shall I shall I answer one by one? Okay. Yeah. Can you can see the, the the question on the right of your uh, screen? Uh, maybe I have to stop sharing my. Ah, uh, see. <laughs> stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. And then I will look at the chat. Yeah. So regarding pre-PET cell, how they can give rise to pre-parietal cells. We, we, when we examine, or if, if you examine the gastric mucosa with electron microscopy, you will be able to see some cases where the pre-parietal cells uh, has long microvilli or pre Sorry, preparietal cells, they always have long microvilli, preparietal. But sometimes you find cells with dual features. So cells which have the long microvilli and also have the, the granules of, of pre-pet cells, the mucus, small mucus granules of pre-pet cells. So the presence of such cells with dual feature indicated 
that pre-pet cell can also give rise to parietal cells. And the same thing for the pre-neck cells. So pre-neck cells, during differentiation of pre-neck cells, they may acquire two different features. You may find some parietal cells, even mature parietal cells with mucus cells. And this is an indication that these cells originate from the pre-neck cells. Uh, I hope this answers your question. Of course, there is still a question mark whether this interpretation is 100% accurate, but, but, uh, but this is the evidence that we took as, as an indication that pre-parietal cells can come from the two other progenitors. Also, we, we, when we did our calculations for the turnover time of the cells and the pathway of the differentiation of the cells, we found that if you consider the pre-pet and pre-parietal cells as, as a source for the parietal cells, this will, 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 will make the model more accurate. Um, I hope this is clear. So the, the, it, it was based on uh, analysis of BRDU label, of, of tritium thymidine labeling of the cells uh, at different experiments, pulse chase experiments and continuous infusion experiments. And we quantified the number of cells at different time points. And, and this was the, 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 the model that we came up with. I think there is a problem with microphone. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, no, okay. okay. <laughs> okay. So, Shall I, uh, shall I read another question? Uh, yes, there is another question. Why Vandita Vashita, why zymogenic cells are not formed when progenitor parietal cells divide? Yeah, very good question. I, I really don't know the answer, why they are not formed from the beginning. But it seems that they are long-lived cells. They survive for very long. They are the longest-lived cells in the, in the mouse gastric gland, according to our uh, experiments. So they survive for more than six months in the stomach. You can imagine with the, with, the, with, the, with the lifespan of the mouse, it's like two or maximum two and a half years. They, the, the chief cells, when they are formed, they, they, throughout the life of the animal, they generate new chief cells maybe three times or four times. So they, they are long lived cells. So they, they require a long process of differentiation and they go through the step of the mucus neck cells. They change their phenotype. So they come from the stem cells and not directly to become chief cells, but first they become, the, the stem cell will become a pre neck cell and then become neck cell. And then the next cell will transform into chief cells. So it's a long process and neck cells survive for like two or three weeks. So chief cells comes later, comes after the mucus neck cells. So they are long lived cells. When they differentiate, they have to come through the, 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 uh, the neck, uh, cells. So they don't come directly from the stem cells. And that's why you don't see them in the vicinity of the, of the progenitor cells. I hope this answer my question. Or answer your if, question. Uh, if there are not uh, other questions, I have one question sure. about sure. Uh, the interaction between H. pylori and uh, progenitor cells. Let us know. What do you see at the next step? Because I see a therapeutic option. <laughs> what uh, do you think about this? About therapeutic application? Therapeutic, uh, therapeutic application. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure exactly what is in your mind regarding therapeutic application. Oh, we know we know that there are there are, there are an abuse of uh, drugs for uh, gastritis for uh, uh, acid. Okay, yes. so we, in my opinion, this is uh, this could be a starting point to develop a new therapeutic approach without drugs, but with uh, with the cells. <laughs> okay. So, so what, what do you think about this? Yeah, I, I think I think it's it's really a fascinating phenomena. Uh, the the uh, if you look at the world's population, more than half of the world's population, like how many participants we have, like fifty participants, for example, 
at least 25 of us <clears throat> have H. pylori in our stomach. And we are all normal. I am talking now normally. I go home. I am married. I have four kids. And so if everything is fine. So it, it sounds to me like H. pylori is a normal, is part of our normal gastrointestinal flora. But individuals are different. So maybe they are normal in my, or they behave normally in my stomach, but in somebody else's stomach, they behave abnormally. So they may become pathogenic in some individuals, not in all individuals. Not in all. And yes. that's why some people, a small percentage of the, of the world's population, they develop gastritis mm -hmm. because of the H. pylori. And a smaller percentage of them develop cancer. Uh, at the same time, the H. pylori itself, it's not only one strain. There are many, we know that there are many strains of H. pylori. There are many types of H. pylori. Uh, so they also modify, they are also different. So we are different and H. pylori are different. So this complicates the situation here. But I totally agree with you, like, like, uh, like cells can be used as a, therapeute, as a therapeutic modality for, for ulcer, for example. Um, but but from my point of view, the, the last part that I was going to demonstrate was about the 3D model of gastric uh, uh, stem cells, which in which we have uh, in collaboration with chemists. I cannot do everything by myself. So with in collaboration with a chemist, we 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 designed scaffold that can allow gastric stem cells to grow and integrate on it. And the idea was to use these scaffolds for, for uh, uh, regenerative medicine. But this is a long story and it's a long way. <laughs> it's a long way. It's there are other questions I can yeah. see. Okay. Oh, oh, uh, how many years and how many people it took for all presented data? <laughs> how many years and how many people it took? People, a lot, I think. Presented that. Oh, many, many years and many people. I, I, I really feel sorry for not presenting my last slide of the acknowledgement. Can I share it quickly? Oh, yes, uh, yes, sure. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So this is my, my small group in the lab at certain stage of my career. Like th some of them are still available in the lab, like, like Subi and uh, Reem and Nitu and Shakila. Uh, so they, they, I, I really acknowledge their contribution. They have contributed a lot, but there are other individuals who are not in the picture. Uh, I, I have listed some people here. This is um, uh, Prashan who has left the lab for his PhD studies. And, and I hope I can move forward. Yeah. So these are other individuals who are not in the picture uh, that I have contributed to this study. Uh, they are in different places now. Ghalia is now an associate professor in Sharjah University. Uh, Roni also working in Dubai. Fathiya is working in the Ministry of Health. And Haifa is a gastroenterologist now. Uh, uh, and Sunita is finished her PhD and she is working in Kuwait. Aron Vince is the, the gastroenterologist and Frank Branicki, who is my colleague still here in surgery department uh, and Jeff Gordon in St. Louis. So these are the main contributors of this study. And of course, I have to acknowledge funding from the different sources from the university and from the National Research Foundation, and also from the Terry Fox Foundation, the Canadian Terry Fox Foundation for Cancer Research. Yeah. A big international group. Question. I would feel bad if I did not acknowledge my <laughs> collaborators. Uh, it's, uh, it's right. So next uh, question. Do, does the amplified stem cells continue the life cycle of stem cells as usual, or they are just uh, for the purpose of, for education? Uh, let me. Uh, <laughs> Does the amplified stem cell continue the life cycle of stem cell? 
as usual as or... usual or they are just for the purpose of education no the, the the amplified stem cells they remain as they don't differentiate they don't differentiate and these animals i i was going to demonstrate that but there is no time to show everything that the these animals which develop amplified stem cells eventually if i keep them for one or one and a half year they develop adenocarcinoma so it becomes an excellent model to study adenocarcinoma as well okay yeah next uh, one is HET for marker for only gastric cancer or T it may be marker for other types of cancer? Uh, I think it is being demonstrated in other tissues as well, other types of cancer. And, uh, and this is documented already. Yes. So the answer is yes. It is a marker for other types of cancer as well. Okay. Why does H. pylori appear spherical when it is enters and interacts with the progenitor cell, whereas it is generally rod-shaped? <laughs> because there is a transverse section, I think. It's the type of section. <laughs> yes, definitely. So, professor, there are no more questions. So I thank you. You are a nice person a wonderful Thank person so really uh, i i'm very happy to to share this uh, section with you thank you so much i really appreciate and i would like to congratulate congratulate the organizers of the of the conference for the for the very well organized conference and i would like to thank uh, dr uh, gulmera for the kind invitation for the participation it's really my pleasure thank you so much many thanks see you soon thank i hope you. thank you very much for your welcoming introduction and and interaction very very thankful to you thank you i, I hope you, you. you we can see in italy in the future <laughs> or so. or in your uh, in your country <laughs> by all means by all means we, we are very much welcoming visitors colleagues to come and uh, and by all means yes we thank will be very, very happy much. to have you here Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, Dr. Jurabekova sends her best regards and, and very thankful for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Many Thank thanks. Thank you, Professor Karam. Really appreciate it. Thank you for all your kind help. Okay, so we can uh, go on with, uh, with our Prof section. Yes. Uh, okay. Professor Shevluk. Yes, Professor Nikolai Shevluk. I'm sorry Can for my Can I open presentation? Nikolai Nikolaevich, da, vo mozhte. Ah, sure. Здравствуйте. He is professor at the departments of histology, cytology, and embryology of the Orenburg State Medical University. Dear friends, my report is reactive and adaptive change in of gonads in vertebrate living in urban ecosystems. <laughs> the purpose of uh, this study is a comparative study of more functional characteristic of endocrine and uh, germative apparat of the testes, vertebrates, and gabidin urban communics. <laughs> this is object. Uh, our object, uh, this is amphibian, uh, two frog and one uh, toad, uh, reptilian, one rizet, uh, many mammals, uh, uh, most like mammals, and uh, uh, ground uh, uh, squirrel, uh, this uh, all uh, animal, uh, is uh, our uh, Orenburg Steppe uh, living. Uh, this uh, very different group of animal. One animal uh, can sleep in winter period. Next uh, animal uh, can uh, reproduction uh, all year. Uh, 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 several um, animals um, living uh, many years, uh, 
uh, time life of amphibian and reptilian uh, four to seven year. Uh, Suslix uh, time life uh, five four seven year. Uh, all mouse like uh, rodents time life uh, one from two year. Uh, this uh, group uh, very different. Uh, one uh, animal uh, contain uh, seasonal dynamics of our production. Next, uh, this uh, dynamic absent. Uh, and uh, investigation, uh, this reproduction system, very interesting, but very difficult. Uh, this is an uh, object. This is region. In what uh, region uh, was investigation? Uh, two urban territory, uh, town Orenburg and town Mednogorsk, and uh, village territory in the uh, Sarktash region of Orenburg area. Uh, this region is steppe region. Uh, uh, temperature in uh, uh, summer very high, to 40 degrees. Uh, temperature in winter uh, to minus 40 degrees. Uh, Orenburg uh, is uh, town. Uh, what consists uh, good uh, environment? Uh, Mednogorsk, uh, this town in what uh, many industry work, and uh, this industry work um, must uh, pollution uh, environment uh, in uh, pollutant consist. Uh, gas, uh, sulfur, oxide, nitrogen, oxide, uh, hydrogenium, sulfate, and many heavy metals. <coughs> this uh, this uh, animal uh, must live in, in this area and uh, must describe uh, question to be on to be in town значит what result at first normal dynamic of uh, testes uh, this uh, animal mm, different uh, in uh, testes structure in uh, lizard and uh, mammalia, in testes consist uh, convolute tubulus. Uh, in uh, amphibia, in testes consist uh, tubular cystic uh, structure. That is, in uh, all tubulus, consist cyst. This cyst uh, consist uh, several. Uh, follicular cells uh, in uh, center consist spermatogenic cells. Uh, in this uh, slide uh, consist uh, convoluted tubulus of a frog and toad. Uh, in the left uh, slide uh, in control area, in the uh, right slide in the urban area. Uh, значит, uh, this uh, dynamics of uh, the spermatogenic cycle, very interesting. Значит, uh, reproduction begin in uh, toad in uh, frog in April. After April, uh, значит, in uh, seminifer tubulus, uh, begin degeneration of spermatogenic epithelium. And in June, July, this uh, spermatogenic 
a cell, uh, uh, post meiotic experiment cell in uh, this uh, tubulus absent. And this tubulus present uh, spermatogonia and spermatocyte. After, in August and September, uh, begin activization of uh, spermatogenesis. And in uh, uh, seminiferous tubulus, uh, present uh, next stage, post meiotic stage. After September, October, uh, begin sleeping period of this animal. And uh, after, in April, begin new reproduction cycle. Uh, значит, uh, our results show does in uh, seminiferous tubulus, uh, in testes of uh, frog in urban area and in uh, control area uh, consist uh, different or different in uh, uh, testes uh, animal or habitant in uh, urban area. Uh, very uh, big uh, square of uh, interstellar tissue. Uh, interstellar tissue very different. In this tissue consists uh, endocrine cells, leydig cells, and uh, cells, fibroblastic cells, uh, and uh, blood and lymphatic vessels. Uh, percent of uh, leydig cells uh, uh, not high, uh, from uh, two to Five uh, percent. In urban uh, territory, uh, percent of uh, lady cells, uh, not many decrease. Uh, in uh, this uh, test is uh, in a lizard. Uh, uh, show picture what like uh, in the last picture what uh, show amphibian preparat in uh, slides slides uh, of lizard uh, from uh, urban territory consist uh, destroyed change in uh, uh, tubular seminiferous uh, this uh, change uh, is uh, disorganization of spermatogenic epithelium, uh, death of uh, spermatogenic cells, uh, pycnos in nucleus, uh, destroyed of gamma-testicular barrier. Gamma-testicular barrier, uh, very uh, interesting, uh, but very difficult, but very complex uh, structure. In, uh, uh, this uh, game cellular barrier um, uh, is bored between uh, postmeiotic spermatogenic cells and uh, uh, immunocyte, what consists in uh, a blood vessel interstellar tissue. This barrier consists at first basal part of Sertoli cells, uh, basal membrane uh, of Sertoli cells, uh, layer of muoid cells. Uh, these cells, because not uh, muscle cells, are uh, myoid cells, uh, these cells like muscle cells, but uh, uh, these cells formate intercellular contact uh, and like uh, to epithelial cells. Uh, down uh, consists next basal membrane, down uh, layer of fibroblast-like cells, but these cells, uh, like fibroblasts, are different or different. Uh, these cells formate intercellular contact. Uh, fibroblasts is single cells. Uh, down uh, consists basal membrane of uh, uh, capillar and uh, endotheliocyte. But this, this gamma-stellar barrier provide structure of spermatogonic cells in reproduction period. After reproduction period, this uh, hemocellular barrier, if uh, this uh, animal uh, consists of uh, uh, seasonal cycle, uh, this uh, barrier destroyed. And in September, uh, formate new barrier. 
<coughs> just uh, at, uh, in this uh, slide uh, consist uh, testicles uh, uh, animals. Uh, uh, значит, uh, this uh, uh, on left uh, uh, mouse, uh, on right uh, uh, one, uh, one, one wall. What uh, this значит, uh, slide consists uh, characteristic of uh, interstitial tissue in a different region of town. This is uh, uh, human house, this is squares, parks, this is a forest built and under it. Значит, very bad environment uh, in town to animals is parks and square. What? Uh, in this, in this um, значит, uh, territory, uh, very many stressory factors and uh, uh, many dogs, many men, uh, many uh, car and under. And uh, uh, animals not living this territory. Uh, what territory uh, like uh, animals in town? Uh, house, uh, значит, uh, this like first, fifth and uh, ninth uh, floor in house. Uh, because, uh, no, I think uh, uh, no body can answer in this uh, answer. Значит, this um, slide consists uh, uh, tubular seminiferous and uh, uh, intercell tissue in uh, major uh, in major uh, mass mouse uh, on left mouse uh, on right uh, common wall. Uh, значит, uh, this Mm, slide uh, show uh, does uh, structure of spermatogenic epithelium like uh, in uh, spermatogenic epithelium uh, of uh, control uh, animals. Uh, if uh, this uh, uh, animal uh, living in park or in a, a square uh, and uh, Seminiferous tubulus, uh, uh, we show, we're looking uh, destroyed of uh, spermatogenic epithelium. Disorganization in the uh, spermatogenic epithelium consists multinuclear uh, giant cells. Uh, uh, in this uh, slide, uh, uh, we uh, was looking uh, pycnotic nucleus, uh, multinuclear cells, etc. This is uh, next uh, animals, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, slide uh, consists uh, number of uh, endocrinocytes in uh, uh, interstitial tissue. Uh, значит, uh, these uh, cells, uh, endocrinocytes, uh, interstitial endocrinocytes of testes, uh, work very interesting. Uh, secretory activity in these cells uh, increase uh, before reproduction period, after reproduction period decrease, and before uh, hibernation, if this uh, animal must uh, hibernation, uh, uh, snow increase. Значит, uh, this uh, Slide show does uh, uh, destructive uh, change in uh, lady cells consist in uh, many uh, towns territory. Uh, this uh, slide uh, show volume of uh, 
uh, nucleus of uh, Leydig cells. A volume of uh, nucleus of Leydig cell. This is uh, factor what uh, show uh, secretory activity. No one from factors what secretory uh, show secretory activity of uh, uh, this uh, Leydig cells. Uh, Leydig cell produce androgens uh, and um, uh, this androgens uh, producing the uh, next uh, structure of uh, Leydig cells. At first, uh, uh, endoplasmatic agranular reticulum. In this uh, endoplasmatic reticulum, begin uh, produce of steroids. Next uh, uh, compartment, we begin uh, this process at the mitochondria. And uh, after all mitochondria, uh, from all mitochondria, we made lipid droplets. In this, uh, uh, slide uh, consists two a stage of uh, uh, two of, uh, a stage of uh, Leydig cells uh, on left. This is uh, control uh, area. Uh, on uh, right, uh, this is uh, present uh, fragment of uh, seminiferous tubulus and the uh, Leydig cells. Uh, down or on uh, left, and uh, this slide show that in Leydig cell consists destructive change or destructive change. Uh, mitochondria uh, is very dense. If mitochondria are dense, this is uh, not good uh, factor to steroidogenesis. Next, uh, destroyed of mitochondria. Dalsha. Uh, destroyed of uh, vesicle and tubulus of endoplasmatic reticulum. Uh, these uh, cells uh, uh, produce uh, steroid, uh, but uh, decrease uh, steroid synthesis. No, uh, next значит, slide show uh, work of uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, what uh, say uh, next statement? You can purpose say that the purpose of men is as very uh, kind, uh, heavy, uh, made uh, the globe uh, uninhabitable. Uh, no, uh, this uh, statement uh, very old. This statement uh, two hundred year, uh, but uh, this uh, statement is correct. Anthropogenic, anthropogenic works. Uh, consist many negative factors. And in uh, our uh, early, uh, not many territory what is wild, not destroyed uh, of men. But, uh, and uh, all, all Animals must describe next next question to be on town or not to be on town. I think that uh, several uh, animals in uh, futures uh, was uh, not present in uh, town. No. This is amphibium and reptilium. Adaptive function of these animals not high. What, uh, what uh, animals uh, must uh, live in in a future town? I think this is uh, mouse-like mammalia. What uh, this uh, mouse-like mammalia? Uh, this Mammalia, what living not far from human house. 
uh, many, many thousand years. And uh, this, uh, this animal uh, consists uh, high adaptive um, значит, function to living not far from a human house. No, thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Professor, for your uh, interesting presentation. Wonderful picture, uh, I know, wonderful histological picture. And uh, you use a large number of samples, I, I can see. Are there any questions on the chat? I'm not no. here. I repeat, I'm not here. Yeah, I, I was asking if there was uh, some questions. Not here. Nikola Nikolaevich, у вас, видимо, отключен динамик. Включен? Вы меня слышите, да? Вас слышу, а вот вопрос не слышу. Please. Она, да, она вас поблагодарила за интересную лекцию, и действительно было очень интересно. И вопрос был, да, действительно, почему, допустим, у синантропных да, грызунов, ну, они прекрасно размножаются, да, а почему, получается, дикие животные страдают. А можно ли вопрос? Пожалуйста. Почему Отв... именно... Я отвечу на вопрос. А, я отвечу. Хорошо. На вопрос. Почему именно да. парки и скверы, скажем, ну, почему именно там более выраженные эффекты? Значит, а... в парках и скверах, на русском отвечать, да, в парках и скверах очень э, высокая э, стрессорная ситуация. Во-первых, большое скопление людей, большое скопление животных. Это враги для этих э, млекопитающих. Это кошки, это собаки, это птицы. Дальше транспорт, дальше э, детские там площадки и все прочее. Это все э, создает неудобные условия. А наиболее удобные условия для проживания вот этих вот Животных – это человеческие жилища, складские помещения, где хранятся продукты, это заброшенные территории, и это э, э, пояс э, лесополосы вокруг города. Это вот э, то место, откуда постоянно идет э, вживание этих э, э, животных в те зоны, в которых они выживать не могут. То есть э, постоянных жителей э, в парках, скорее всего, нет. Это входящие после размножения весной из других регионов, а к осени они все равно погибают. Вот такое мое мнение, так я думаю. Спасибо большое. Я переведу. Uh, my question was, why this, uh, the impact and why this interstitial uh, tissue was more developed in the animals uh, from the squares and parks uh, rather than, for example, more polluted areas? Uh, the answer was that uh, in the parks and squares inside the urban uh, territory is the most stressful place for any animals because there are a lot of people there, uh, which is a stress factor. And also there are some uh, like preda predators, the uh, carnival uh, uh, animals. And all the animals, they are, uh, this, the park is uh, not uh, a biosystem. All the animals, they are, they are just, uh, you know, uh, just uh, temporary uh, inhibitors. Uh, temporary, uh, they just temporary come there and they do not uh, stay for a whole year, the year round. So that's why he said his opinion is like that. Uh, Uh, Николай Николаевич, здесь еще один вопрос. Пожалуйста. Uh, от uh, профессора uh, Шериф Карам, вот, от нашего лектора. Uh, из, uh, наблюдали ли вы uh, различия в uh, сертолей uh, клетках у uh, нормальных, ну, как у обычных видов uh, из вашего исследования? Понятия имеется в виду в городских условиях, в контроле или вообще среди популяций? Наверное, и, и, и контроль, и, и ваша вот изучаемая популяция. Ну, 
это мы конкретно на ультраструктурном уровне не исследовали клетки э, сертоли. Мы больше внимания обращали на э, клетки лейдига, интерстициальную ткань, и исследовали только базальную часть клеток сертоли. Вот в базальной части клеток сертоли, значит, когда э, условия городские, в сравнении с условиями контрольными, наблюдалось разобщение интерстициальных контактов, прежде всего. Наблюдалось разрыхление базальных мембран, которых целых три. И базальная мембрана, на которой лежит клетка сертоли, и базальная мембрана, на которой лежат миоидные клетки, и базальная мембрана, которая у кровеносного или лимфатического капилляра. Вот это мы наблюдали. Так, простите, еще раз, разобщение, я просто... Разобщение контактов между, клет... между базальной частью клеток сертоли. То есть базальная часть клеток сертоли, она всегда mm -hmm. имеет в норме плотные контакты, дисмосомы там и прочее. А mm -hmm. верхняя часть, она уже не имеет. Вот в базальной части находятся mm -hmm. домиотические клетки, а mm -hmm. в следующей там уже mm -hmm. находятся постмиотические. И вот постмиотические, они защищены вот этими плотными контактами. Uh, okay, uh, Professor uh, Karam, uh, the answer for your question uh, is that we didn't uh, uh, focus on the Sertoli cells. Our focus was the Leydig cells, uh, interstitial, interstitial tissue, and the lymphoid uh, tissue. But what we have seen in the uh, Sertoli cells that there was uh, this unity Uh, between the basal part and uh, upper part uh, of the Sertoli cells. Yeah, so th this, this is the answer. Thank you, Balsam, for your translation. <laughs> Russian is not my matter. <laughs> so I think there are no more questions. So we can go on uh, with the next uh, speaker and uh, I want to introduce uh, Professor Diana Lyashenko. She's from Russia. She's the Dean of the General Medicine Faculty, Head of the Human Anatomy Department, Orenburg, Russia. Okay, Nikolai Nikolaevich, спасибо большое. Да, вы можете, пожалуйста, остановить демонстрацию? Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Malzan, do you hear me? Do you see my presentation? Yes, yes, we can hear you and we can see your presentation. Yes. Please go on. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, dear Professor Bianchi, uh, dear colleagues, thank you very much for organizing committee for an invitation to present our um, scientific uh, results in this very grateful uh, symposium. And uh, today my first report will be uh, devoted to our data about Uh, anatomy of the heart and prenatal shams in features of the 16-22 weeks of development. And uh, the modern medical technologies uh, allow us to talk about the developing features as a small specific patient with uh, its uh, own uh, details uh, and uh, its own particulars and it is caused by a number of factors. The first factor, one minute. The first factor is the routine using of pregnant woman ultrasonic examination. Or, and uh, now during a pregnancy, each uh, woman can uh, have such examination uh, several times. Another aspect is a new medical criteria for live birth which are used in different countries according recommendation of all World Health uh, Organization, including Russia. And uh, we understand that medical manipulations of deeply prematurely newborns 
must be carefully anatomically and topographically based because it's very specific small patient. And uh, we didn't tell about uh, the third point maybe 10 years ago, but now we can tell that fetal surgery, which is active develop, uh, develop now, uh, give for us new and new tasks uh, in fetal anatomy and topography. And scientific direction of our human anatomy department of Orenburg Medical State University is devoted to study of fetal uh, anatomy, fetal topography, and uh, first our data about heart and uh, some intracardiac structures today I want to present you. Due to absence of quantitative detail um, data about this uh, anatomy and topography, we uh, revealed only rare publications in the field. I tell about uh, publications which are based on uh, studying of sectional material. About ultrasound uh, data, we have many, many publications, but sectional material uh, in some countries is uh, forbidden. Uh, in some countries, it's uh, closed due to uh, religion uh, problems, maybe, and aspects. And uh, we have no practically good publications with uh, this quantitative data. Therefore, the purpose of this research is uh, to obtain new data on heart anatomy and topography, each chambers and septums in human fetuses within the period of 16, 22 weeks of development. Our materials, we uh, studied torsos of 105 human fetuses of both sexes of this age period without a pathology of internal organs and chest deformation from our fetal collection, from our department. And each sample uh, we included in our this study in, uh, due to inclusion criteria. You can see this criteria uh, in this slide. And I want to pay your attention, due to such delicate material as fetal material, always uh, for our scientific direction of department and for each research work in this uh, scientific direction, always we must obligatory receive permission from our local ethical committee. It's obligatory. And uh, what methods uh, did we use? Classical morphological methods, such as macro-microscopic preparation, methods of uh, sections uh, according to Pyrogov, histotopographical method, morphometry, and quantitative analysis. Sometimes, if it is necessary for research work, for example, this work, we uh, divide all our samples of uh, features to some age groups. And in this uh, study, we divided all features to four uh, groups. 16, 17 weeks, 18, 19 weeks, 20, 21 week, uh, weeks, and 22nd week. For receive, uh, to receive more details and uh, quantitative uh, data about changes of anatomy and topography of the heart and intracardiac structure. And I want to pay your attention to this uh, photos. There are a photo of one of torso uh, of features. And on the left side, left picture, you can see anterior view of thoracic cage, posterior view on right photo. And uh, in each sample of um, features, uh, we always, as a first step of our uh, study, we remove skin, uh, prepare uh, ribs, tonum, intercostal spaces, on uh, as a left photo, vertebra column, each vertebra, and note some vertebra. Why? Because for us it's very important to receive concrete and uh, clear uh, uh, skeletotopic level according to vertebra. We must know vertebra number, rib number, intercostal space number, because for uh, description of topography it's very important. So what results did we receive? After opening of the thorax, superior left picture, uh, we open uh, thoracic by longitudinal cut of sto uh, sternum. 
we can see in the features uh, tosses, both lungs, thymus, pericardium with heart, diaphragm, and liver. And then we remove lungs, thymus, pericardium, and receive isolate heart with all chambers and mm, may, uh, large uh, vessels of mediastinum, such as superior cavity vein, uh, aorta, uh, pulmonary trunk, inferior cavity vein, and others. I want to uh, present you isolate uh, preparate of the heart and pay attention, please, that fetal heart is an organ in this uh, age period, 16, 22 uh, weeks of development uh, has been already completely formed and uh, practically all structures of heart can be uh, defined in this preparate. For example, right ventricle of the heart, left ventricle, right auricle and right atrium. This is left auricle, it's posterior view, left atrium, left uh, right atrium, superior cavity vein with each uh, tributaries, ascending aorta and aortic arch in this picture, for example, descending aorta, pulmonary trunk, arterial duct, I will tell about it later. All structures can, we can see and we can uh, study, we can study. Uh, our results showed that in uh, this uh, investigated period, uh, the heart grows primary due to increase of its length. It increases by uh, 57%. And this uh, increase all increases only uh, by 14.5%. While examine, uh, examine of uh, preparations, uh, we pay attention to interesting uh, feature of fetal feature of oracles of heart. Uh, and uh, unlike uh, an uh, adult person heart, oracles of heart in fetus uh, heart uh, have uh, the same uh, sizes as atrium. And uh, some uh, parameters of uh, oracles are comparable with parameters uh, of uh, atrium. For example, length of left auricle, left auricle uh, in fetal heart always has such interesting tones shape. And uh, each lens on left side is comparable with the uh, lens of left atrium. And right auricle in fetal heart, it has this triangular shape with basis and uh, wider, uh, sorry, with wider basis and uh, acute apex. And the sizes uh, of this right auricle are comparable with sizes of right atrium. It is very interesting and it's typical for fetal heart. Other chambers of heart. I want to stop on left and right ventricles because they have very important pump functions during uh, pregnancy and during developing uh, in prenatal period in developing fetus. And both ventricles are good developed in this period. It's one uh, sample, uh, right picture, another sample, and you can see a good developed, for example, uh, not on apex of heart, sometimes it could develop, and this is right ventricle, it's left ventricle, and it's left lung with the uh, heart or cardiac uh, node of left lung, and a growth of left ventricle in this age period uh, is uh, presented by enlargement of all uh, sizes of left ventricle as length, as wide as and, uh, this, and um, wall thickness. And I want to pay your attention to uh, value of wall thickness of left and right ventricle, which is presented in this uh, table. Uh, unlike adult heart, the wall thickness of left ventricle and right ventricle are comparable and they have practically the same uh, value, pay attention to this uh, value, in both, in all uh, age groups. And wall thickness uh, of ventricles uh, has a high rate of increase uh, by the 22nd week of development, 70, uh, sorry, 68% and 85% on left and right uh, sides, respectively. 
Next uh, part of, of uh, and next step of this uh, uh, study was uh, receiving information about topography of heart and heart structure. And in this step of our study, uh, very useful for us are uh, different cuts uh, of torsos according to Pyrogov. And uh, more informative uh, plan in this uh, step of uh, our study was horizontal plane because it can, can it give us uh, gives us uh, ability to uh, describe uh, as holotopy, as skeletotopy, and syntopy uh, of heart and all chambers uh, of heart. And uh, pay attention, please, to these pictures. Yes. Heart is surrounded by lungs. Posteriorly, we can see esophagus, descending aorta, for example, uh, anterior thoracic wall with sternum, vertebra with uh, ossification, nuclear, and other structures. It's a uh, horizontal cut too, and on the right picture, you can see a uh, sagittal cut through median line of the torso with vertebral column, with esophagus, with sternum, and it's a diaphragm and liver and structures of heart. What we revealed? We revealed that uh, upper, right, and um, inferior uh, boundaries of the heart expand to the, by the 22nd week of development. You can see our scheme in this slide. And left boundary of of heart it saves uh, the stable position uh, during all these uh, weeks. And uh, uh, by the sec 22nd week of development, heart turns uh, slightly right and up uh, in the thoracic gate. And a very interesting syntopy of fetal heart because we revealed different variants. It uh, syntopy with uh, surrounding organs, especially different variants in uh, syntopy with thymus, with lungs, and with esophagus. What we revealed. This uh, uh, slide demonstrates uh, for you uh, topography of heart and relationship of heart with thymus. And superior photos uh, showed that when thymus is not very large, it can cover only uh, superior part, or not superior part, basis of heart with large uh, mediastinal vessels. But if thymus is good developed with two large lobes as uh, inferior pictures, yes, sometimes it covers a uh, basis of heart and anterior part of anterior wall of heart together with lungs, sometimes full anterior wall of right and left ventricles. Different variants of the heart relationship with lungs are uh, presented in this slide, and I want to pay you attention that cardiac uh, node of left lung can be absent, superior left picture, can be good developed, but uh, heart and lungs only adjoin each other, and can be very good developed when apex of heart is surrounded, pay attention in inferior right picture, is surrounded by lung tissue. We think it's very important, this variant is very important for fetal surgery, especially fetal surgery of mitral valve and aortic valve. And last interesting uh, fact about syntopy of fetal heart. Different variants can be in relationship between esophagus, esophagus and posterior wall of left atrium. Sometimes in some samples between these organs, left atrium and uh, esophagus will be distant like superior uh, pictures. But in some samples, it, uh, we revealed such samples, 40% uh, of uh, features, uh, esophagus pressed to posterior wall of right atrium and practically it produced into the uh, left atrium cavity. The next, uh, uh, sorry, and uh, uh, all these quantitative characteristics of fetal heart relationship with surrounding organs, we presented in this three second week of development, some uh, organs, uh, some distance to uh, organs can have negative rate of gain, for example, this is soft. 
but uh, the case more clearly was found. For example, right main bronchi, uh, right vagus nerve, uh, they have uh, increased uh, and sometimes uh, 25%, 70%, and more. Interatrium septum is very interesting structure of the heart and pay attention to this please photo. Interatrium septum in this uh, age period has an um, interesting difficult petrol orientation because it, it is situated under the angle in two planes, in frontal plane and in sagittal plane. And by the 22nd week of development, it inclined anteriorly up and uh, forward. It, uh, and uh, it's uh, practically occupies, I return to previous picture, it's practically um, full occupied, is occupied by over foramen or fetal heart. Interventricular septum, it gives many congenital defects, we know it, and it requires such congenital defects, require operation in uh, postnatal uh, period. And uh, what can we tell about this uh, septum and features heart? It's good developed. And uh, it uh, grows in this period, uh, is, uh, was, uh, according to our data, uh, is provided by increasing of its length and a wider true. And uh, it has a stable position. It has stable holotopy, skeletotopy, and syntopy, but as interatrium septum, interventricular septum uh, in the end of age period uh, turns slightly and really and right side. Very interesting for morphologists and for all specialists uh, who uh, treat uh, and diagnose uh, features, ultrasound doctors, MRI uh, specialists, fetal surgeons, Hemodynamic significant trunks uh, and feature structures uh, such as oval foramen, arterial duct, inferior vena cava valve. What can we tell about this structure? Oval well, foramen and fetal heart, I said it, occupies practically all uh, interatrium septum and it repeats its difficult special orientation under the two angles in two planes. And interesting fact that oval foramen grosses in this period mainly due to um, increasing of each uh, width uh, more than 142%. Very interesting inferior vena cava valve, Stekian valve, because it was described by Stekian many years ago, but we have no good pictures with this valve. I want to show you this, uh, this valve. It uh, has in this age period a uh, view like a um, thin uh, plate which is situated in frontal plane. And according to our data, this is second valve, it's view, inferior view, inferior view. And this valve has, uh, it's a pra practically, it is a continuation of wall of inferior cave vein. This is inferior cave vein and each continuation of this wall. And um, we revealed uh, that, according to our mind, such uh, frontal position of uh, Eustachian valve plus uh, this position of interatrium septum and oval foramen under the two angles together, these uh, structures provide normal uh, fetal circulation uh, in the heart when uh, blood must be passed from inferior cava vein through oval foramen into, from right atrium into the right, left atrium. Due to such position as taken valve and oval foramen and interatrium septum, we receive features receive this uh, blood flow. And the real duct. Uh, ultrasound doctors always tell about arterial duct, but I want to show you this duct and features heart. Pay attention to left picture. It's a uh, lateral left view. We uh, turns, uh, turned heart and uh, it's a uh, left atrium with oracle. This is pulmonary trunk. It's arterial duct. We noted it by uh, right uh, pointer. This aorta left vagus nerve, all branches of aortic art, two left pulmonary veins, 
And uh, in right side, you can see uh, two pictures. It's inferior view. Pay attention, please. There are uh, horizontal, it's one horizontal cut by Pyrogov. Yes, uh, this uh, inferior uh, view. And uh, we in introduction uh, pointer into the uh, arterial duct. What we revealed. Really, arterial duct is very short. And uh, it is a, a continuation. It's a real continuation of pulmonary trunk. I want to show you next scheme. It's another sample. It's continuation of a uh, real duct. It goes in the same plane, in the same direction. It's very short and wider. And really, um, I can tell you about it. Few samples, we cut during preparation, dissection, we cut with duct because we are waiting uh, for very long duct, but we then we reviewed very short and wider duct. So, and uh, this uh, duct is opened into the uh, aorta, we know uh, this fact. And during our, uh, sorry, according to our data, this duct grows uh, during the fetal period, mainly due to increase uh, uh, of its uh, wall thickness. And uh, pay attention to this histotopographical cut. Wall thickness of arterial duct grows more than, increase more than uh, 40%. And uh, interesting, it contains a good, strong uh, um, structure. It has uh, like a muscular wall because maybe it's a, a part of vessel. And as a conclusion of our data, uh, our um, complex of uh, anatomical and topographical data about fetal anatomy and topography of the heart and uh, chambers of heart uh, allowed uh, us to uh, give um, a morphological uh, basis uh, of cut of through three vessels. Uh, it's uh, so called it's ultrasonic uh, examination, Dr. Chong. They have cut through three vessels. We give uh, them this anatomical basis of these vessels. For example, this, yes, and uh, this cut, it's a topographically difficult cut with some vessels, superior cavity vein, ascending aorta, pulmonary trunk, uh, both uh, uh, main uh, bronchi, esophagus, descending aorta, lungs. Thymus. Then we described four chambers heart with a uh, pyrogov cut, with histotopographical uh, methods, and we received these uh, structures. And uh, we publicate these materials. And uh, we now we want, we continue with uh, investigators. It's only part of our study. We want to compare our sectional results with uh, results of ultrasound, ultrasound uh, normal uh, anatomy of fetus heart, because you know now there are many good uh, high experience ultrasound uh, uh, examination uh, techniques and apparatus. Thank you very much. And I want, I can, I can answer for your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Yashenko. You collected a lot of data, compliments, many compliments. Thank you, thank you. Are there any questions? No, I, I think uh, your data may be useful in clinical setting, very useful. So if uh, there are no questions, I think we can go on because we are just a little bit in late. Balzan, help me. There's no question in chat. No, I, I don't think. Yeah, it seems that no question. OK. We can go on. So the next one is uh, Ambar Beisenbeb from uh, Kyrgyzstan, Faculty of Medicine, Russian Slavic University. Yeah, I'm not sure if he's here and uh, yeah, but he received the, the confirmation the link. Yes, yes. 
and he didn't answer my WhatsApp text, so I'm not sure. So, so we won't could go we, on yes. with the, the next yes. one, uh, eventually after we can uh, present him. So Professor Sergei Lyashenko from Russia, from Orenburg, with an interesting presentation on the perirenal space after Plassi. Сергей Викторович, здравствуйте. Hello, only one moment. Good morning. I, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, I prepare my presentation. One moment. Uh, you can see my presentation? Yes, sure. Oh, okay. Excuse me. Don't worry, take your time. Вы можете нажать F5, и тогда включится. Да, я пытаюсь. Один момент. О, окей. Good afternoon, Serena. Good afternoon, dear colleague. Thank you for your opportunity to make a report at your conference. And I will speak about morpholog morphological changes uh, after post-nephrectomy space experimental plasty. Uh, <clears throat> more than uh, 25,000 nephrectomies are performed annually in Russia alone and due to kidney cancer. Every year, tens of thousands uh, of such operations are performed uh, in the world. And after this operation, the doctor, uh, as such, uh, a doctor monitors uh, the patient, look uh, for metastasis, but they uh, do not follow the changes in the position topography. Uh, of the abdominal organ. What happens to the abdominal organ in uh, a year after uh, left side uh, nephrectomy? You can see uh, the patient CT scan uh, examination after uh, left side nephrectomy, and you look dislocate uh, a lean uh, displacement posteriorly. Uh, you look uh, lean, you look uh, the standing uh, colon, uh, posteriorly to dislocate, and very important anatomical fact, uh, you can see a tail of the pancreas uh, deformate and uh, have a back position uh, after uh, left side uh, nephrectomy. Uh, next case, uh, this CT scan after uh, nephrectomy on the patient uh, on the right side. This uh, 
CT scan demonstrate uh, dislocate liver and liver uh, after operation have a, a back position, dislocate posteriorly, dislocate uh, ascending colon. And very important anatomical fact, uh, duodenum and descending part and head of the pancreas uh, dislocate too. Uh, with, uh, with date, um, I took on my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Chemizov and Professor Kagan. And uh, with a uh, change in the structure and topography of the organ, has functional disorders of this organ. And the aim of uh, our study, uh, intra, uh, intra operation, intraoperative uh, prevention of uh, topographic and anatomical change after removal of kidney and its surrounding fat tissue in the experiment. The first task is to create a model of post nephrectomy changes in the experiment. This uh, uh, CT scan uh, is a normal CT scan or a bit uh, before uh, operation. And this uh, is a series, and you look uh, superior pool of the. Uh, Kidney, uh, kidney, rabbit's kidney, a uh, uh, middle level, hilum of the kidney, and inferior. And we CT scan demonstrate a normal uh, topography and uh, the standing colon, normal topography, uh, stomach, loops of the small intestine, and, uh, and another organ. And after uh, you make uh, uh, 10 experiment on 10 rabbits, uh, weight 3.5 uh, to 4.5 kilogram, uh, nephrectomy uh, with the surrounding tissue was performed under anesthesia. Five nephrectomy was performed on the right and five on the left side. Um, before the operation and then after it, one, three, six, and 12 months uh, later, CT scan of the rabbit abdominal cavity was performed and, and within uh, among the organ of the abdominal cavity, uh, more specifically the colon, the loops of the small intestine, the spleen are uh, displaced uh, posteriorly and allocated in the urinal bed of the retroperitoneal space. Uh, this uh, rabbit after operation, and you look uh, kidney absent and the standing uh, colon uh, early in a loops of the intestine uh, has a posterior position, dislocate uh, to back position. And uh, this model, uh, similar uh, topograph anatomical change uh, on uh, the patient. After that, you prepare uh, an axial uh, histotopogram of the retroperitoneal retro space. Uh, this uh, axial histotopogram um, a normal uh, before operation and look uh, for orientation with uh, muscles uh, erector spinal, external. Donal and transverse 
uh, muscles, abdominal wall, and with uh, fat tissue, connect tissue, uh, retroperitoneal space is a parietal peritoneum. And uh, middle uh, uh, kidney uh, level, uh, you look a level, uh, vessels, uh, kid kidney, uh, kidney and rounding fat and connect tissue. This uh, uh, parietal peritoneum. Uh, fever after three and six months and after one year, the topography of abdominal organ uh, after operation doesn't change. And uh, this uh, situation stopping. After uh, operation, uh, you look at the topogram of the retroperitoneal space of the rabbits after radical nephrectomy. Uh, you can see a wall of the standing uh, column with a uh, lean, uh, loops of the small intestine, and this organ fixate uh, in, uh, in retroperitoneum and fixate in uh, a kidney um, bed um, uh, position. Uh, second, uh, second task uh, is to develop and to create a model uh, of the uh, post nephrectomy space plasty in the experiment. CT scan on experimental animal before to surgery and uh, this uh, series CT uh, gram uh, where I look superior uh, pool of the kidney, uh, medial level, inferior. And uh, you make this uh, research, this uh, procedure uh, for morphometry uh, kidney and retroperitoneum. Uh, uh, space because after operation you make implant and uh, implantation uh, this region this area uh, surgery stage uh, is a uh, experimental operation experimental surgery and with laparotomy and uh, you can see kidney and fat and connect tissue around kidney with a retro peritoneal space of uh, the rabbit. And after uh, removed uh, kidney and fat uh, tissue and with uh, fragment, this area uh, after uh, removed. And a last photo demonstrate uh, implant uh, the shape and size similar to uh, this fragment. After, uh, after operation, uh, after uh, removed, you uh, implanted uh, this implant, silicone implant, uh, fixate this implant uh, to 12 ribs and posterior wall of abdominal uh, cavity and suturing. Uh, parietal peritoneum uh, uh, and uh, uh, implant. And implant, uh, full implant localized um, uh, retroperitoneal space uh, and uh, don't localize uh, abdominal cavity. Uh, between the retroperitoneal uh, space and abdominal uh, cavity, uh, the border uh, parietal peritoneal. And after uh, operation, uh, you make CT scan examination uh, and a look uh, implant. And uh, this uh, level uh, superior pool where uh, 
was localized at superior pool of the kidney uh, middle uh, level and inferior uh, pool. And you look the topography uh, abdominal organ uh, similar a uh, normal a uh, normal situation. Uh, the standing colon loops of the small intestine localize uh, and don't uh, change uh, your topography. This is a reconstruction and you uh, may uh, you may look uh, a kidney and implantation implant uh, implant after uh, nephrectomy and implantation uh, this area with a, a normal CT scan uh, a kidney and uh, a CT scan after uh, implantation uh, implant uh, and uh, uh, topography uh, abdominal organ uh, I don't uh, I don't change and with uh, and with uh, histotopography uh, through uh, six months uh, after uh, implantation and you look uh, muscles back muscles uh, lateral abdominal uh, wall and this implant the implant clear visible, which is localized on urinal bed. The abdominal organs uh, have a normal position and uh, implant that uh, shape and uh, size implant uh, and its uh, position do not change through six months and through uh, one, uh, one year. Uh, the histotopogram uh, show the implant uh, and imperfectly occupies the renal bed, uh, tantly adjoins the um, posterior abdominal wall. Uh, above the implant, uh, where is an integral parietal uh, peritoneum. Morphological examination show uh, to scar and tissue, uh, no prolonged process, uh, not scar tissue, no prolonged process uh, around the implant. Uh, there was no displacement, uh, rejection, uh, or breaking uh, after operation. And, and conclusion. Uh, and the, uh, we obtained uh, on optimal model of uh, post nephrectomy change and uh, plastic surgery of the post nephrectomy space allow you to prevent post operative topographic and anatomical change. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Lyashenko. Uh, knowledge of the retroperitoneal anatomical space is fundamental in surgical anatomy. <laughs> so uh, your presentation is very important, in my opinion. Uh, are there any questions? No. Uh, so I, I want to make a question. You uh, demonstrated the, the dislocation of several intraperitoneal organs after nephrectomy. So I guess that uh, this condition may cause uh, several clinical problems. So do you think that uh, this experimental uh, plasty may be introduced in clinical settings? Uh, the main task uh, of Stina's work uh, uh, use this uh, uh, method uh, on clinic, uh, but uh, you uh, make only first step our, uh, our stance work and with uh, experimental, uh, experimental probe, uh, 
because uh, you you must uh, see uh, all all effect uh, our implantation and only um, and only uh, use and control uh, experimental animal you may transfer this technology on, on the clinic uh, our, our work uh, is uh, uh, only one part because uh, you research the patient after uh, nephrectomy and you look functional uh, functional pathology uh, uh, pancreas uh, liver and uh, you think you must correct uh, this uh, this pathology symptom uh, on uh, the operation time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? No. So we can go on. The next one is again Diana Ryashenko from Russia with another topic involving the internal base of the skull in fetus. Dear colleagues, uh, give me please feedback. Do you hear me because I changed my earphones? Do you hear me and do you see my presentation? Next presentation. Yes. Yes. Very, okay, very thank good. you. Thank yes. you. Okay, thank you, Valjan. Well, I want to present our uh, second uh, scientific uh, direction in fetal anatomy and uh, to tell you about our data, first data, uh, about fetal anatomy of the internal base of the skull and hindbrain and uh, in age of 20, 22 weeks of development. Uh, it's uh, one of large uh, step of uh, our uh, fetal anatomy the, uh, scientific work and uh, now our interest uh, we have interest uh, interest in the uh, anatomy of brain in features anatomy of spinal cord in features vertebral column and skull uh, and I want to present today our first data. I want to tell uh, thanks for my young colleague from my team, for Dr. Siridinova, Tatiana Siridinova, and for Dr. Dmitry Gusev, because uh, they uh, have this interesting uh, scientific work now about skull and hindbrain, and uh, some young colleagues too. Well, why we stop on this uh, um, subject? Because it is difficult subjects to study skull and to study brain in features. Uh, they have the features uh, of structure and development uh, due to not full completed um, process of ossification due to water in uh, vol large vo volume of water in the brain. But congenital uh, defects of the brain and skull have a, a frequency of occurrence near 30-40% of all congenital defects. And very important that uh, these congenital defects uh, are one of main uh, cause uh, for future childhood disability and adult disability. Therefore, uh, we considered that it's, it is very interesting uh, subject for our research work. We know Chiari malformation, we know uh, congenital uh, hydrocephaly, and uh, we must know normal anatomy of skull and brain for prevent and maybe for provide fetal surgery of such congenital defects. In this regard, the purpose of this study uh, was to obtain new data of the quantitative anatomy of internal base of the skull and height brain. And we limited in this research, our uh, scientific, uh, scientific research, the period of 
three weeks to the 20 from 20 to 20 second weeks of prenatal period what materials uh, heads of uh, 30 normal human fetuses of both sexes i will not repeat uh, um, from because I said today in first report about inclusion criteria, uh, about uh, local ethical committee permission, but I want to tell you that um, we uh, try to include in this sample sort of heads only such heads which have no deformation of skull due to cartilage structure of some bones in this period and deformation of brain. We use the same methods uh, as always in our fetal uh, anatomy studies. And in this uh, slide, you can see our proper uh, photos. It's a uh, right side isolate preparates of isolate brain. We remove it very delicate from skull. Um, median picture um, you know, is uh, contains uh, brain with uh, skull. And in a uh, left uh, picture, you can see features. Uh, skull, uh, internal basis of features uh, skull without brain and without calvaria of skull. Our results. We revealed that uh, for uh, receive, uh, to receive uh, the quantitative details, uh, knowledge and data about anatomy of internal basis of skull, I want to start from basis of skull, then I will tell about brain, hind brain. Uh, it is necessary uh, to um, have two steps of the study. Firstly, before removing of uh, dura major of uh, encephaly, and then after remove of dura major, because really it uh, can be a large difference between sizes and between ability to visualize of uh, different structures of internal basis of skull with uh, dura major and without. And before your eyes in this slide, uh, it's uh, internal view, basis of skull, it's uh, superior uh, view, and uh, with a uh, dura major, without removing, before removing. You can see that in this age, 20 week of uh, development, we can uh, clearly define uh, anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, and posterior cranial fossa with different structure. For example, uh, olfactory tracts and and uh, optic nerves, optichism, celetosica, uh, for example, uh, foramen occipital magnus, some cranial nerves, and others. And uh, some specific, very interesting, according to our mind features, we revealed in internal base of skull in features. And before your eyes, the first with such specific feature, I today I stop only on posterior cranial fossa. I have no time to tell you about full uh, internal base of skull. And I stop on posterior cranial fossa. Pay attention, please. There are left and right pyramids of temporal bone. And you can see for developing internal ear, which in this age, Produce, produce, sorry, into the uh, posterior skull uh, fossa. And you know, unlike an adult person skull, unlike children person uh, skull, uh, in this, in features period, we can see developing internal ear in the skull cavity of features. It's very interesting feature according to our mind. And we want to discuss this feature with a specialist in uh, uh, otolaryngologist uh, with a field of medicine. And the second feature, what I want to pay your attention, uh, there are different bones, for example, occipital bone, uh, petrosal part of temporal bone, clivus, this uh, part of sphenoid bone, and pay attention, we can see as cartilage parts of this bone, as uh, um, ossification nuclei in this bone. So, next. Posterior cranial fossa of the features, yes, give us 
due to good develop, give us ability to uh, measurement its sizes and uh, we uh, after removal of dura major and uh, we uh, measurement uh, uh, longitudinal and transfer sizes. Later I will show you table with the sizes. And I want to show you and to pay your attention this internal year, which we can see from middle, uh, from sorry, posterior skull uh, cranial fossa, and very good view has the anterior semi uh, semicircular canal, which produced uh, direct into the uh, cranial uh, fossa cavity. We can see in this uh, scheme. Um, internal acoustic natures, apex of pyramid, clivus, for example, and uh, internal acoustic natures in right photo too. Internal acoustic meatus opening in uh, sorry opening in this uh, age period uh, has oval shape and uh, due to its uh, position under the angle uh, we uh, measurement uh, its two sizes longitudinal sizes and transverse sizes and longitudinal sizes value was so uh, 3.6 millimeters on uh, right side and 3.4 millimeters on left side and uh, vertical or transverse size was uh, around uh, 2.4 2.3 millimeters respectively Next uh, photo demonstrates uh, for you uh, clivus of uh, fetal skull. It is formed by part of sphenoid bone and part of uh, occipital bone. And very good, uh, we can see very good uh, uh, large uh, nuclear of fossification in the basis of this clivus and cartilage part, yes, uh, cartilage structure in superior part of this clivus. And uh, sizes of uh, clivus was longitudinal size lens, uh, 30.2 millimeters and transverse size, the largest transverse size, 6.9 millimeters. Large foramen of the occipital bone has um, such like uh, um, drop-like shape with uh, wider anterior parts and more narrow posterior portions. It has some parts, some borders uh, with cartilage tissue and uh, some uh, maybe points of uh, ossification nuclear and uh, each sizes in these uh, age uh, groups, 20, 20 second weeks of development was uh, longitudinal size 14 millimeters and transfer size uh, 11.63 millimeters. Interesting uh, view uh, occipital has occipital bone and pay attention please for these two grooves. There are grooves uh, from uh, sinus of dura major and uh, we paid attention to large sizes of uh, dura major sinuses when we firstly started uh, hindbrain. Uh, really, uh, especially uh, sphenoid sinus, oh, sorry, especially sigmoid sinus, transverse sinus of dura major in this fetal period uh, have large sizes. Why? It's discussable now. We only think uh, and we have our mind and maybe it's just necessary to continue to study the sinuses, but then we revealed large sizes of grooves from these sinuses in occipital bone. For example, we note the sizes uh, grooves uh, letter A and uh, letter B. And uh, the sizes of uh, this transfer sinus can be in uh, this age period near 3.4, 3.5 millimeters. It's a large size for such age because features in this uh, period is small and head of features is small too. Next uh, interesting structure uh, in uh, uh, posterior uh, cranial fossa, this number four, mastoid, pre, most, mastoid sorry, foramen from mastoid emisha vein. It has oval or round shape uh, and in all our uh, feature sample was this shape and uh, uh, sizes uh, near diameter near 3.2, near uh, 3.8 millimeters. And 
uh, two large two neck structures in uh, this posterior cranial fossa, jugular foramen and hypoglossal nerve uh, canal. Jugular foramen due to difficult uh, spatial orientation in the skull, in adult skull too, and uh, jugular foramen we investigated and measurement, measurement from uh, external basis of skull. We rotate head of features and uh, uh, prepare with foramen. It's uh, better to, for measurement. And uh, sizes of this foramen was longitudinal size near five millimeters and transfer size uh, on left side 2.2 millimeters on right side 2.7 millimeters. And could develop a hypoglossal nerve canal. We want to show you today two and in this age and it always in was uh, in all samples of features it uh, has had uh, this oval shape with longitudinal and transverse sizes too uh, and uh, longitudinal size was two millimeters on each side and 1.2 1.3 millimeters uh, of, of your, uh, transverse sizes uh, in left hand side in right side too and uh, I want to show you this uh, histotopographical card. Uh, this uh, it's uh, stained by a Van Gezon uh, method, and it contains brain with hemisphere, uh, managers of brain, and uh, some structures of skull, including uh, this internal basis of skull. Number four means nasal cavity, uh, and you can see, for example, cella dosica. Number one, very small pituitary, oh, sorry, hypo, hypophys pituitary gland, and it's occipital bone and uh, another. And uh, hypo, this uh, histologic, histotopograms uh, help uh, us to receive maybe small details in uh, anatomy and topography of uh, brain and of skull anatomy. And uh, as I tell in first report today, uh, told uh, um, give us ability to receive small details of microscopic anatomy and topography in features. And uh, it's uh, summarizing uh, tables uh, with uh, sizes of all the structures which I said now, and I um, told these uh, sizes, I will not stop because I want to tell you uh, short information about hind brain of features. So why we stop on hindbrain of features? Because uh, hemisphere, you can saw it from first my uh, photos in this presentation, hemisphere in this age is not good developed. Uh, uh, practically all grooves and uh, sulcus are absent. Only eyelids we can see and sometimes sylvian groove and only formation, starting of formation of Roland groove. But, and Roland sulcus, but Hindbrain uh, in this uh, age of period, in, of prenatal period, uh, is good developed. And all parts of hindbrain and, and supplementary mesencephalon too, we can see. There are two photos of uh, macro preparates of hindbrain. And on left photo, pay attention, this is medial oblongator. We, in this photo, we open posterior uh, skull uh, cavity. We remove occipital bone and its posterior view for this uh, brainstorm. And this medial oblongator number four, then we can see cerebellum, mesencephalon, and number uh, four, uh, there are uh, parts of hemisphere. La right photo demonstrates for you anterior view of uh, brainstorm. We can see medial oblongator, pons, and uh, um, peduncle of mesencephalon, and uh, small portions of hemisphere. What can we tell about medial oblongator? External view, microscopically, uh, all structures of uh, medial oblongator in this age of features are good developed. We can see anterior longitudinal uh, fissure, pyramid, olive, and uh, I change photo. It's a um, sagittal cut of head 
of features, and we can see medial oblongated too. It's a uh, number four for ventricle, and number uh, five it's um, cerebellum, and uh, mesencephalon. You can see brainstorm in this photo too, and medial oblongator. For receive. Uh, details, uh, quantitative data, we uh, measurement uh, medial oblongator in superior part, the, uh, more wider and inferior portion too, because we think uh, that our data can be useful for ultrasonic doctors for revealed, uh, to reveal uh, maybe congenital defects of medial oblongator. And our data you, you can see uh, before your eyes. And in uh, different organs, we revealed this um, difference in right side, bilateral data uh, on right side and left side, but in brain, uh, this bilateral differs in uh, value of different sizes. Uh, we'll pay attention, our pay attention, especially in cerebellum, and later I will show you. Pons, fetal pons, it's very interesting too, and uh, very interesting specific feature of fetal pons, which we revealed. Its shape, shape of pons. Uh, we know uh, we know that uh, adult pons has um, it's really like pons due to this like bridge, yes, transverse position, and uh, in adult person uh, longitudinal this transverse uh, size more than vertical size, but in fetal pons transverse uh, size and vertical size are comparable. And uh, pay attention please to this picture. Yes, it's a uh, fetal brain, uh, anterior view. Uh, pons in features has practically quadrangular shape. Uh, it contains uh, basal groove, Always we reveal these grooves in all samples. Uh, good, uh, we can uh, um, reveal a good developed uh, fifth and seventh pair of cranial nerves and this conditional uh, trigeminal facial line, uh, which is a conditional landmark between pons and medulla, uh, median cerebellum peduncles, and of uh, um, sizes of. Uh, parameters of the pons you can see in the scheme and pay attention that width and length of uh, pons in both these uh, eight groups were, com were comparable. Cerebellum, interesting part of uh, hindbrain as adult person, as children, as a pawn, as feature, sorry, what we revealed. In this age period, uh, it could develop it contains vermis, it contains both hemisphere, but uh, floculus it contains, but surface of uh, cerebellum uh, is more smooth because uh, sulcus and uh, foliates are not good developed. And sometimes uh, sulcus are not deep. And uh, now we want to uh, um, see, we want to investigate internal structure of cerebellum due to this feature and to determine uh, thickness of cortex of cerebellum and nuclear of cerebellum because we receive now only received only microscopic data about cerebellum. And pay attention to this table. Uh, I said about bilateral differs in sizes of cerebellum in brain and in cerebellum, they pay, uh, paid our attention because on right side, value can be different from left side. Uh, maybe it's a bilateral uh, asymmetry. Uh, maybe it's formation of uh, right or left hand and uh, dominant part of brain in the features. Now we can't answer to this question, but it is really interesting. And I want only to show you, because I have no time to stop details in this uh, part of our uh, study, but pay attention, there are horizontal sections uh, of full head of features on different uh, levels. I included this um, legend uh, of uh, this fortress. And these uh, different uh, levels cut of uh, head like cuts of thoracic cage and abdominal cage and pelvics, 
help us to receive details information about topography as brain parts as a skull tool because we can reveal nasal cavity internal basis of skull cellulitosica for example orbits superior wall lateral wall inferior wall posterior uh, surface of occipital bone and other structures of s skull and we can see uh, and we can reveal and exam all parts of brain including uh, brainstorm including hemisphere and very interesting now for us uh, both ventricles uh, less lateral ventricles and aqueduct or cerebral and fourth ventricles and so too and uh, I want to show you this um, histotopographical card. Uh, it demonstrates for us uh, this uh, clivus, this uh, um, ossification nuclear nasal cavity, developing nasal cavity with uh, septum of nasal. There are managers of brain, hemisphere, medulla oblongata. And I want to announce it, our continuation of this study. And I want to show you spinal cord uh, anatomy to its uh, next part of our uh, study of central nervous system in the fetus and skull. And uh, we have in our team and very interesting and excellent Dr. Galiakbarova, Victoria Galiakbarova, and there are her uh, photos uh, because to um, investigate to study brain and skull without spinal cord it nothing in features and we continue our study in this uh, direction too excellent preparates of spinal cord and dura matrix features and opening into in cervical part this is coda uh, sorry coda equina in fetal uh, organism yes in fetal uh, spinal cord it's very delicate as skull anatomy as brain in features as spinal cord very delicate and precious work for our investigators and for our team uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I can answer for your question. Thank you very much, Professor Lyashenko. Your uh, presentation is uh, full of uh, information. I hope you will apply the, the same techniques uh, in uh, other parts, uh, not only spine, but only uh, also in nasal cavity, in orbit. So you can share with us uh, uh, this precious information. There are any questions? No, I think uh, it's starting another uh, another section, another parallel section. So someone is leaving. So we can uh, introduce the last uh, speakers of this section is uh, Erin Hutchinson from South Africa. Uh, she will talk about uh, the uh, human man mandible, the development of human mandible. Good afternoon. Thank Good you afternoon. Very much for Welcome. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present at this meeting. I think it's absolutely fabulous. All right, just give me a second to sort out my pointer. All right, greetings from Johannesburg. Um, I'm Dr. Erin Hutchinson, and it's a privilege to present findings coming from a study that's at present assessing the bone quality of the immature human mandible during dental development. And this study is done in collaboration between myself and Professor Beverly Kramer here in the School of Anatomical Sciences. So if we have a look at the general well, the ability to successfully perform life-sustaining nutritional intake, both prenatally and postnatally, this is very much dependent on the development of the individual's ability for sucking, suckling, and then masticatory skills. The development of the mandible and the masticatory apparatus is also crucial in this particular function of life. Now, during the prenatal and postnatal stages of growth, Changes in biomechanical force are a result of the development and emergence, and then, of course, the subsequent eruption of the dentition itself. And this is very much linked to there being an increase in the level of function, 
as of the masticatory apparatus and its associated structures. So we can already see that during this period of development and growth, there is very much a link between the development of the masticatory apparatus structures, as well as the functions in which they're going to perform as mastication becomes more sophisticated. Now, the development of the masticatory apparatus results in a change in the loading conditions which are linked to the mandible. And this is very much coinciding with that of the development of the dentition and the eruption of the dentition. Loading conditions are thought to play an intricate and extremely vital role in how the mandible or the bone associated with the mandible undergoes modeling and remodeling. And again, this is very much linked to what we see in terms of physiological tooth movement. Now, as the loading conditions of the mandible are going to change with an increase in masticatory function, there is also a change in the internal architecture of the bone in different regions of the mandible. So for instance, what you would be seeing in the ramus of the mandible is going to be very different to what you're going to see in the body of the mandible, owing to there being different structures imposing loading forces on these areas. Thus, the aim of our study is to evaluate changes in the internal architecture and trabecular bone across the body of the immature mandible during the early stages of dental development. And how we did this was to look at the lingual, then central trabecular, and buccal areas of the basal part of the body of the mandible. And in looking at these respective areas, what we focused on predominantly and for the purpose of, of this presentation was the trabecular thickness, the trabecular number, and then of course, the spacing between the trabeculae in this area of the mandible itself. In terms of our materials, all materials were sourced in accordance with the Human Research Ethics Committee of the University, the University of the Witwatersrand. In total, we had 45 fetal and neonatal mandibles, 28 of which came from fresh cadaveric tissue, which was of unknown provenance, and 17 mandibles were sourced from skeletonized individuals, which is housed in the Raymond Dart collection of human skeletons. Now, in terms of looking at the materials itself, because part of the sample came from unknown provenance, one of the first steps that we had to do was to determine the age of the entire sample so it was standardized across the entire sample. And how we went about doing this was every mandible was subjected to small dental radiographs. We had two sets of dental radiographs. These included an anterior view, which was associated more with the anterior dental crypts. And then we had a lateral view, which was more associated with the posterior dental crypts. We then took these dental radiographs and we compared them with dental development standards that had been previously proposed by Alcatani and Liversidge already in 2010, which they published through the London Atlas of Dental Development. And based on this, we then subdivided our sample into three groups, namely a prenatal group, which went from 30 gestational weeks to birth. We then had an early postnatal group, which covered the first year of postnatal life. And then the final group that we had was a late postnatal group. And this went from one to five years. And it was done so purposely in accordance with dental development standards. Once we had determined the age of all individuals, we then took the mandibles to the South African Nuclear Energy Corporation and we subjected them to micro CT assessment with the following parameters. And part of this process, you first have to create volume files with the scans, and then you take those volume files and then you analyze them using BG Studio Max software, which gives us the ability to look at the finer bone quality structures that we did for this particular study. Just to orientate you, so this is a transfer section through the mandible, looking at a posterior dental crypt, 
where we've got the molar tooth in place. To analyze the basal region of the mandible itself, we had to take cross sections through each of the dental crypts. Now with the anterior dentition, so these are your central, lateral and canines, what we, well central incisors, lateral incisors, and then our canines, we only took one single section through the central component of the dental crypt. In the case of the posterior dental crypts, which is our deciduous molar one, two, and then our permanent molar, because the posterior dental crypt is somewhat longer in its configuration, we took three sections. These included a mesial section, a midpoint section, and then a distal section through the dental crypt. And what we did in this particular instance was we took all data that we derived from the mesial, the midpoint, and the distal sections, and we averaged them to get a representative value for the dental crypt in its totality. In terms of the data that we generated from this, we selected nine regions of interest associated with the basal part of the body of the mandible. Three of these corresponded to the lingual aspect, three corresponded to the central aspect of the basal region, and then three corresponded to the buccal aspect of the basal region. In doing so, we also took sections from the superior aspect, the middle aspect, and then the inferior aspect. So in total, we covered nine areas of interest in the basal part of the mandible itself. In terms of overall statistics and descriptive analysis that we did, we did a series of descriptive statistics. We then had a look at running an ANCOVA, and this was done primarily to see if there was any age influence. We then took it a step further and we ran a MANOVA test. And the purpose of this was to assess the level of interaction between the independent factors, which in this instance would be age or tooth group, and that of the dependent factors, which was our tubercular thickness, number, and spacing. Significance was taken at P being less than or equal to 0.05. So if we have a look at our results, and I'll focus first on trabecular number, what we noted, particularly in the early, well, the late prenatal and early postnatal groups, was that we had a far higher number of trabeculae associated with the anterior dentition versus that of the posterior dentition. And this trend tended to persist across the lingual trabecular and buccal regions. Slightly less so in the trabecular or the central part of the basal part of the mandible, but definitely when looking at the lingual and the buccal aspect. Again, looking at the postnatal aspect, same sort of pattern emerging throughout. What was very interesting to note was that particularly associated with the second deciduous molar on the buccal aspect, this was where we had the lowest number of trabeculae across the late, well, late prenatal and the early postnatal groups. When we compare the late prenatal and early postnatal groups what we, to the late postnatal group, what we find is that the, dis, the distinction between the anterior dental crypts and the posterior dental crypts in terms of trabecular number is not as great or as pronounced. And this could be attributed to the level of dental development. It also could be linked once again to the functional environment. If we have a look at trabecular thickness, what we see again is that there wasn't too much variance that was observed, particularly in terms of the thickness of the trabeculae across the anterior and the posterior dental crypts particularly when looking at the early prenatal and or the late prenatal and the early postnatal groups. And this did persist across the lingual, the trabecular and the buccal areas of the basal part. 
What is very interesting to note, and if we think about this within the context of trabecular number, when we had a look at trabecular number in the second deciduous molar relative to the buccal aspect of the basal part of the mandible, we observed that there was a decrease or a significant decrease in the number of trabeculae. When we have a look at this in terms of the thickness of the trabeculae, we see that the trabeculae are significantly thicker associated with this dental crypt versus the other dental crypts. And this could be attributed to the fact that there isn't a high degree of distinction within the trabecular region of the mandible in this particular area itself. In much the same fashion as we saw with the trabecular number, we see with the trabecular thickness that our late prenatal and early postnatal groups had a significant degree of variance to them, whereas the late postnatal group really didn't have much variance at all. It almost, in a sense, appeared as if trabecular thickness had been established in the bone and, and this was it going forward. When we now relate the trabecular number and the trabecular thickness to what we see in terms of spacing, we see the opposite sort of relationship that's occurring. We're looking at trabecular number and trabecular thickness we saw a high level of variation occurring in terms of number and thickness in the late prenatal and the early postnatal groups. In the case of the trabecular spacing, we see very little variation, if any, occurring in these areas. What is interesting to note is that when looking at trabecular number and trabecular thickness, in the late postnatal group relative to trabecular spacing, we see the opposite relationship. So thinking back previously to number and thickness, wasn't much variance. Whereas in this particular instance, there's a significant level of variance. What is also very interesting to observe is that where we saw higher numbers of trabeculae in terms, or high numbers of trabeculae as well as thickness in the anterior dental crypts, what we're seeing with spacing is that there's far more spacing occurring with the posterior aspect than there is with the anterior aspect. And this could largely be attributed to the bone differentiating in response to masticatory forces, whereas the anterior dentition is going to differentiate far more and far quicker because the dentition is erupting earlier. We see the opposite happening with the posterior dental crypts where there seems to be more of a lagging behind in terms of differentiation in the trabecular region because these teeth are taking longer to erupt or are delayed in their eruption relative to the anterior dentition. So when we relate our findings, what we see is that in terms of the prenatal and early postnatal periods of growth, the higher number of trabeculae in the lingual area may be indicative of the lingual bone being more developed as a result of biomechanical force stimulating growth. And the biomechanical force, particularly during this period of time, largely comes from the tongue adopting a certain posture to accommodate sucking and suckling. Over time, the tongue's role will diminish slightly, but particularly in this period of time, it's incredibly important and does impose quite a bit of force in this area. Increased trabecular thickness and, of course, a reduction in trabecular spacing associated with the basal bone of the posterior dental crypts is indicative of the early stages of trabecular differentiation. And again, this can be very much linked to the degree of dental development and also the eruption sequence of the teeth. In terms of looking at the trabecular number, thickness, and spacing associated with the basal region of each dental crypt, the pattern that we've observed or the trend that we've observed may be indicative of the degree of dental development as well as the level of biomechanical stimulation emanating from a change in the associated functional environment. So again, it's speaking to what is happening in terms of function. Is there sucking? Is there suckling? Are we chewing? That type of thing. And that's going to very much influence how our trabeculae 
come across and or how they differentiate. Looking at the late postnatal period of growth, we found that there was a low level of variance in the trabecular number and thickness, but a high degree of spacing when compared to areas of the basal bone associated with each dental crypt. And once again, this speaks very much to the advanced level of dental development within the internal architecture of the basal bone. Now, changes in the internal architecture of the body of the mandible, as we have concluded, is very much associated with the level and degree of dental development during these periods of growth, but also is very much linked to the change in the direction and degree of biomechanical force, which is applied to the mandible with the transition in function from suckling to mastication itself. And I would just like to take this opportunity to just acknowledge a few people who have been instrumental in assisting us with this particular study. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you to you, Professor Hutchinson. Are there any questions? No, I have a question. So oh. uh, what do you think about uh, the influence of uh, trabecular bone on uh, dental defects? So I think in terms of looking at how the bone configuration influences the dentition, the bone configuration very much can have an impact on things like where you have impacted teeth and that type of thing where the bone does fuse to the roots of the teeth. So it's, it's very important to chart a normal development or to look at how the bone differentiates itself under normal circumstances so that you can see preemptively if there is something that's going wrong in terms of this differentiation, it can be picked up early and treated early. Thank you so much. Thank any, you very much. Any question? No. Can I, can I ask one quick question? Oh, yes, oh, sure. No problem. Uh, I'm just wondering how would you correlate your findings with the information known about Wolf's Law? So to do that, what we need to do is we need to then further expand our study and do full-on biomechanical testing which at this particular stage, what we did do was we looked at changes in the bone quality. Now, the next phase of this work is to take it that step further and start actually doing biomechanical testing and see already what the level of force is that this bone can take relative to the functional environment in which it's expected to function. Okay, thank you very much. And just a very a second question, very, very quick. Oh. No um, we used to tell, since you are a, you are a, a bone specialist, it seems to me, uh, maybe I can ask you this question. We used to tell our medical students since long time ago, we used to tell them that, uh, that bone developed before birth is, is woven bone or the primary okay. bone. But once yes. the baby is born, all bone developed will be secondary bone and gradually it will replace woven bone. Is this fact still a fact, still true, or, or there is a dispute about this? I think there is a great deal of debate that's occurring in terms of the sequence of woven bone versus secondary bone. And this debate very much speaks to what's happening in terms of the functional environment that that bone is expected to deal with. So you would, for instance, if we translate this and have a look at it in terms of the mandible as such, there are certain areas of the mandible that are going to develop far quicker than other areas. And that development and the progression of bone from woven bone onwards is very much linked to the, the force and the stimulation that that bone is subjected to. So you'll find that the more Stim biomechanical stimulation that that bone receives, be it from the tongue pressing against the mandible or it's the dentition that's eventually erupting or even mouth opening and closing during sucking and suckling. Those areas that are directly influenced by that bi biomechanical force is very much going to be 
far more advanced in their development and their ossification, et cetera, than other areas which are maybe more secondary in their, their configuration. Okay, thank you so much. I think bone is, is really a very interesting tissue and organ at the same time. It's fascinating. So are you planning Thank to you. expand your studies with, with some microscopic analysis or? At this point in time, we are looking at doing the biomechanical work first. And then once we've done the biomechanical work, depending on what our findings are, then expanding it into other methods to interrogate this further. But yes, at this point in time, I think the next step in the process is to, to secure the biomechanical testing and get that sorted out. Yeah, but thank you very much for the suggestion. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much for the information. Yeah, many thanks. So, as uh, we end today's event, uh, and uh, I would like to thank you all for joining the conference, for your active participation. I would like uh, is to express my gratitude to all the speakers because they are sharing their expertise with us. And uh, I would like also to thank the organizing committee, especially Gulmira, uh, for giving me the opportunity to chair this important uh, section. And many, many thanks uh, to uh, Balzan for uh, her technical uh, support. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, in the next Congress, we will be able uh, to meet uh, physically <laughs> all together and shake our hands personally. So thank you to all.